Morning, everyone. It's uh, now 10 o'clock. So, Steph, I'm, if you're ready to start, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for coming today. I'm getting, uh, is that through your feedback? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for coming this morning um, to this meeting. A uh, couple of things to say thanks for the officers coming. It's good to be here in a different venue. I'm uh, slightly disappointed that we don't have a better turnout amongst members at the moment. I wonder if one or two of them have underestimated the distance they might have uh, to travel to get here. But um, for some of us, travelling a distance is part of the part of the course. So um, I, I'm going to start on time. I'm not going to wait for them. Um, so thank you very much for coming today. Uh, first of all, and an apology that this meeting agenda was changed uh, very late on. Um, as you know, we were due to discuss at great length the water uh, issue. Um, unfortunately, one of our prime speakers was unable to, to make the meeting at short notice, so we, we had to move. We felt it was very important to have that speaker present to allow balance to the debate. Um, and so we are hoping, and this will come up later, that this will be a single item agenda and an, uh, a, a special meeting next month. But we, that comes up on the agenda, I think, so we can talk about that later. So, so um, our apologies for having to change that. I'm disappointed because I wanted to get this debate done. What I will say is that there's a number of important uh, items on the agenda. And from a personal point of view, um, because we only meet once every two months, a lot of stuff gets bumped onto the agenda quite late because it has to come to us before it goes to full council. And this has made, this, this potentially would have made this agenda extremely crowded and may not have allowed us to have had the kind of debate we want over the water issue. So in the long run, it might be a good thing. So welcome everybody. Um, I'm presuming everybody can hear okay and that we're going through online. Um, the agenda pack with papers is available via ModGov or directly from the council website from the link which was sent out to members. If I invite somebody to speak, could you clearly state who you are for the benefit of anybody who is listening to the meeting so they can identify who's speaking. Can I also warmly welcome any members of the public and media who are joining us today online or otherwise. Uh, this meeting is being recorded by the council. Finally, as agendas are now viewed electronically, could I kindly request that members and officers refer to page numbers from published agenda, from the published agenda pack to assist all present in finding the appropriate information. Um, okay. Moving on. Apologies for absence then, please. No formal apologies. Uh, I've had an apology from Adam Boyden, who's running late and will join us later. Um, Minutes from the previous meeting. Who's taking that? That's it's for you to. It's for me to decide. But we, I to guess it. we've all looked at it. Um, yes, Henry. Mr. Chairman, at the previous meeting, it was correctly recorded that this meeting would be solely dealing with the water situation, and that if it wasn't and it wasn't completed in time, that there would be an October meeting. I would like to know why, when that's in the minutes, we have yet to give a date for the October meeting, because the later we leave that date, with the more difficult it's going to be to get research people to attend the meeting. Um, there are other research people, apart from Peter Lamb, who, just so you know, is paid for by the water industry, and Penny Johns told me nearly a month ago that she was not going to be available for September, but if she had a date, she would be available for October. I have written to Jamie Jackson and the monitoring officer asking for a date on three occasions, and it's yet to be put in the diary. If it had been in the diary, we would have been able to be start planning for that meeting considerably before this. And I'm sorry, I don't accept. It could have been uh, put in the diary as if needed date. It didn't need to be down there as a, a permanent date, if you understand what I mean. Um, it's now become needed and we've yet to get any invitations out because we don't know the date. Right, thank you for that. Well, I'm, I, unless an officer wants to respond to that, um, I will. Would you like to respond? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, Chair, if you'd like me to. So, 
Henry, uh, Councillor Hobhouse, I completely understand your frustration of where we are. It has proved incredibly difficult because we're hoping that seven speakers from seven different organisations will be attending. We are just coordinating diaries now with those seven speakers. We are keen to make sure it is a fair and balanced debate and that members have all of the information before them and I know Councillor Hobhouse was particularly keen for that, that to happen as well um, and it is important members have all data data in front of them and all of the relevant bodies um, involved with this so as soon as we have that coordinated I will let obviously I will confer with Jamie and obviously with the chair and get that date published uh, yeah, thank you very much, Kirsty. Uh, Henry Hobbers. Sorry to come back, Mr. Chairman. There's a researcher who did all the agricultural research and mo read most, wrote most of the uh, Sajic paper, which is the basis for Sagis and Simcat, who has agreed. I asked him if he would attend an October meeting. He has agreed to do it. I will give Kirsty his name. His name is Paul Withers. He is professor of this subject at Lancaster University. Penny Johns can only do certain dates in October. If we had had the date, we would have been able to book her. I doubt we're now going to get her. Thank you. I think you make a valid point. Um, I was approached on this subject in pre-meeting. And uh, at that point, I thought it was a good idea that we discussed when the next meeting would be because we've all got commitments and it's difficult to schedule and I thought it'd be better to discuss it in this room. And that was a couple of weeks ago. So that's, that's my understanding of the situation and that we will discuss it later and try and hit on a date. Can, Kirsty, can you please talk to me about the other researchers and I will get in touch with them and give you their names and numbers. Thank you, Henry. We have been in touch with, with Penny, Johns, and with um, Paul and, and a number of others. So Kate Murdoch is, is in contact, trying to coordinate all of those diaries so we get them all here. Uh, it's I'm, no mean feat, because October's a busy lecturing month for them as well. I know. What I would say is that, that, that in, a, in normal circumstances, normally this is, this, the next meeting, the October meeting, will be actually an informal meeting but that means we can ring fence that subject. What I cannot guarantee as chair is that I won't be asked to put something on an agenda in the future that as it, on, on an urgent business, but it's really irritating, I agree, but it's almost impossible to keep an agenda to one item or a number of items and then find that actually there's important or urgent business comes forward that then has to go to full council. I can't turn around and say, well, I'm not discussing it. So, you know, the, any idea in the future that we might be able to ring fence one particular debate and not have anything else on the agenda, I think is a lost cause. I, I wouldn't, I understand where you're coming from. It's all about call ins. Um, and if scrutiny deals with it before it goes to the executive or full council, it can't be called in, which is why you want to do it beforehand. But if that was the case, why in July was it pushed that we did, didn't have an October meeting? And we, Because I said at the time we should actually have an October meeting and it was agreed to change it by Alan, who's not here. Um, because they, they didn't want to have the October meeting. Now, if that's the case, Mr Chairman, in future, when we need to do a specialist subject, can we have an agreement now that we will have an informal meeting off the agenda where nothing else is going to be brought on, so that we, and it's agreed in advance, and I mean permanently agreed? I can't make that decision now, on, on the top, off the top of my head. I, I take I take into I take the matter to into question. I do I do think you have a val valuable point, but I'm not prepared without discussing it to say that I'm I will do that. But what I will say, if you let me finish, is that I've been discussing with Scott Waldridge and other people the possibility, and and the, the chairs of scrutiny are, are in agreement that there aren't enough meetings, and that we want to do something about that. So I'm hoping this situation won't arise again. Declarations of interest. Sorry, we haven't formally agreed the minutes. We've discussed that issue. Any others? Can I take it that we formally agree then? Right, thank you very much. Declarations of interest.
any interests other than those that we know about as town or parish councillors? No? no? OK, thank you. We have, uh, next on the agenda is public question time. Um, I'm wondering, we, we're going to find out now whether there are two, there's, there's a couple of questions we've, we've been, have been submitted are going to be read out. Um, we want them actually before the item on the agenda. So, well, I think these, these two chair would come out now, would be read now. It was okay, all right then. So, the, the item for public question, uh, Linda Ann, is she in the room? Um, or online? Do we have or Robbie Bentley? Oh, it's on the yeah. Robbie, right, okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee, and thank you, Officers. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Peter Travers of Somerset Catch the Bus Campaign, who have been working with this Council or on matters relating to the uptake of passenger bus services across the county and the, re and the wider region. We have concerns about the proposal within this spatial planning committee if, if within this scrutiny for spatial planning with respect to the heritage impact that the demolition of Yeovil's very long established building which is currently used by First Earth and which is being proposed to be demolished in the, in the near future. It is one of the more noteworthy buildings in Yeovil's long industrial heritage. And we do feel quite strongly that it is perhaps something that a listed, uh, that a listing may actually be appropriate for this. Having seen pictures of this myself, having seen the style of it, see, as well as the historical reference to this town and the way in which this town has been able to be developed, we are of the consideration that it is something that should at the very least be considered a heritage asset for the region um, as well as, as for this town. And it is something that I do think is a little bit short-sighted, both from the perspective of how much revenue first could actually generate if they were to hold on to it and the impact it could have. The, the bus depot has, be, has had many uses over the years and to allow the demolition would, in our view, be very, very, very short-sighted. And we would ask that scrutiny consider whether or not a listing may be appropriate for this is building. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. Um, you catch me slightly unawares. I'm not sure whether it's in the remit of this committee to be able to to have any say over listed building. Would somebody like to answer that one for me? I don't believe it is, Chair, so I think we'll, we'll take that away. You, you believe it is? Yeah. I, don't, I, don't I don't believe it is, believe it is no. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. <clears throat> <coughs> Hi, just to say that listing to a large degree is a planning issue and, um, and also you need to determine who, who is going to drive this and you can do this as an individual, as a group, you can go to your town council, any of those options in terms of actually getting a listing. And if you want some support and advice, then it's worth talking to the conservation officer within planning south um, to actually um, take it further forward. But it's not actually necessarily the responsibility of the council per se to list. Thank you for that. That's really useful. And, and I would recommend any councillors uh, particularly if you're from the Oval area or this particular broader area, that you, you also take, take this matter up with Robbie and uh, offer advice where possible. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. We have another speaker, I think, online. 
Yeah. Is that Tony Reese? Yeah. Tony Reese, are you um, are you able to speak to us online? Yes, I hope so. You can. Thank you. anger over the existing bus services, all of the things in that statement are urgent and need, need dealing with. But I think this committee needs to be aware of just how badly our services have got, how much worse they are still getting, and we are not fulfilling a service of providing a proper transport service. I speak as one who lives near Yeovil, our Yeovil service has been reduced and reduced and reduced again twice this year. Um, we need to find ways of funding and providing a bus operator who has the services of Somerset at heart. Thank you very much. This is not an, item, uh, an agenda item for this meeting. But I've got Councillor Rigby in the room and he'd like to make a reply. He's the uh, executive member for transport and highways. Thank you. Can I just start off by saying that I, I'm given very strongly to the feeling that I'm back in the first year of primary school because clearly we couldn't afford the chairs that went with the height of desks that we've got in this office. The exact opposite of Sedgemoor, where I was yesterday, where I felt like Gulliver perched up here somewhere. So maybe we can swap the chairs from here with Sedgemoor and all, all will be well. Um, Thank you for your comments, Tony. I've had a number of interesting conversations with Tony over the last few weeks and with his fellow campaigners, and uh, I agree with much of what he said, that our goal when we took control of the council was to stabilise the bus service in Somerset. In some areas that's worked, in some areas, uh, fr frankly, it hasn't done. Um, we've had a number of occasions, fairly lengthy periods this year, where we've seen the percentage of missing miles, that part of the scheduled service that isn't delivered for whatever reason, rise to unacceptable levels. There will always be a bus that doesn't work and it's, it, it takes some time to replace that, drivers that aren't necessarily well enough to drive. But we've seen on some occasions the missing miles get up to 6%. That's way out of all proportion of what we would find acceptable. Um, I've got a number of outstanding concerns about how the bus service is, is operated um, largely in Somerset by first, um, and I have a meeting um, in uh, two hours and 41 minutes with uh, the managing director of first, so I'll be leaving this meeting at 12 to, to go and have those conversations with him and to express our concerns and Tony's concerns and his fellow campaigners about how the bus service is currently operating. Thank you very much for that, Mike. Um, th and thank you for your question. 
Um, I think the next question will be is addressed to uh, about the awards of contracts for highway services. So I'm going to propose taking that uh, prior to that item coming up on the agenda. I think it'd be relevant to do so. Um, agenda item five. This is the work program and action tracker. This is uh, Jamie Jackson to present. Thank you, Chair. Um, Apologies to the committee, the action tracker was only circulated uh, late uh, yesterday. Um, the, the purpose of the action tracker is, is effectively to keep an eye on uh, actions and agree uh, sort of recommendations and um, areas of progress that the committee want to see um, happen. Uh, each, the action tracker will come to each meeting and will be uh, red, amber or green, depending on the progress we have made on those. If, if an item listed comes to the committee with a green status and the committee is happy, then it will drop off the next time. And obviously there's a number of items on the, the track you've got in front of you with a green uh, background, so they will disappear for next time. And obviously it's a good way of us keeping track of things that we may be finding challenging to progress. Um, in terms of the work programme, we still, uh, that is outstanding at the moment. Um, and one thing that I want to get finalised with uh, service colleagues ASAP to give you a good idea um, of what's coming up. Obviously, we have already had the discussion about an October meeting, and, and the date will be clarified uh, as soon as possible to members on that. Uh, the next meeting date after that, obviously, is the 22nd of November. And as part of that clarification to members, I'll probably try and clarify what we will be expecting on the, on the November agenda as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Any questions on that? Yes, Dave Mansell, Councillor Mansell. Let's see if I can work out the microphones we're not used to. Um, so, um, yes, thanks for that. Good to uh, to see uh, the the track and the and the, uh, the forward plan work program. Um, in in terms of the uh, the forward plan. Um, Normally, the, the committee will, and, and even other members, will have opportunity to feed into that. So um, it would be really helpful to have the forward plan, but can I also be a little assured that others aren't going to try and completely fill it and stop you know, anything else from being added in, because the, uh, the committee should have some opportunity as well. Absolutely, and that, and that will be shared with the committee in a fairly fairly fluid state so that there is a, that opportunity because as you say absolutely this should be the opportunity for members to contribute to that as well and, and, and I, I do not want to see any scrutiny forward work program as officer driven it should be a good balance between member and officer. Uh, Councillor Covers. Thank you chair um, yeah on the um, it was the um, highways responsiveness one funny enough I got asked this uh, not that long ago in a by parish council actually because it's something I'd mentioned because obviously one of the things they do moan about or sometimes the only thing they moan about is highways um, it says ongoing and I think was that the one where it said um, beginning of September or early September obviously we're now 20th of September when is that task uh, that going to be set up by that task and finish group and while I've got the microphone safe if I would come back to me with regard to the future transport one that I saw was on the previous um, previous minutes um again do we have actual date of when that will be set up by because i do suspect that one you know listening to the previous speaker and indeed the portfolio holder as well um that is that is quite loud um but not as loud as or an important as the um the task and finish for future transport should be because actually it's not necessarily just future transport um it's probably transport next month rather than transport in the future. Thank you. Thanks very much. Any further comments or questions? Okay. We, could we have an answer uh, about the um, when the first meeting is going to be of the um, uh, task and finish group, which is supposed to be starting in September? That's next on the agenda. Can finish group. I, I will I again I will need to have a discussion with uh, service colleagues and come back to you all as part of that as part of that. I'm not on sorry. It's the energy plan. sorry Henry. I will need to have a discussion with uh, service colleagues and come back to you all on that as well obviously there is a uh, 
we do need to get that set up. Okay. David, Sorry, David. Sorry. Yeah, we can we can we can update you if if that's helpful. Um, when we when we um, talked about this, I think it was in June, was it in the June committee meeting? Was it May? I forget. Um, the scrutiny meeting at the time. Um, we just just to give you a view, the way that we deal with um, uh, public inquiries and the front end of, of that that process, which is where quite a lot of the interaction happens and the pass off between various services that sit in, in my area. And um, business support do that work for us. And unfortunately, uh, the person, I won't name them, that, um, that organizes that business support, so who was integral to the review of the correspondence and, and the responsiveness of the service, unfortunately was taken ill and, and still hasn't returned uh, at the moment. So we're in a situation where we um, we need really to get business support services. Um, we need to have the leadership back in there to be able to then have the conversation with the task and finish group because at the moment, obviously, it's not really fair on, on, on them to say, can you come and supply information? They are the conduit by which most correspondents are answered, certainly certainly via email to the services. So that's, that's the reason we're not ready at the moment. And I think we'll have to hold on to that for, an, for another few months until such times as, as we're clear where that leadership is coming from. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if we could be updated on what the situation is so we know when we're actually going to start. Thank you. Any other points? No, okay, let's move on then. Um, Agenda item six, Somerset Energy Plan, Task and Finish Group. I think Jacob Hall is going to, to present this one to members. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Chair. Morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Jacob Hall. I work in the climate change team. Um, I did come to the previous scrutiny prior to uh, Union Tree for Somerset County Councils to present on this. So a um, bit of an update and also a request today for the scrutiny committee to approve a task and finish group to set up to review and feed into the energy plan over the next few months as we start to uh, produce the deliverables within the aims that we've set out. Um, just to recap, so our, our project aims of the energy plan are to produce a high level assessment of suitable renewable locations for energy um, across Somerset, particularly in regards to the development of the new Somerset local plan. Um, looking on top of that on our own assets and where those overlap with as well, and we'll be producing a, a GIS map um, showing those uh, constraints and also those subjective constraints, so things like grid constraints. We're also going to be producing uh, an investment and an economic impact assessment and then a roadmap of how we achieve our 2030 um, net zero target versus the 2050 national target as well. So we split the project into three work packages. Work package one has been taking place over the last couple of months, and so this is why we want to set up the task and finish group now. We want to start reviewing the, the, um, the outputs that we're creating. So work package one is around baselining, so what we've currently got and what we need, and around the mapping, so what the GIS mapping has come up with so far in terms of opportunities. Over the next few months, we're going to be developing the roadmap and the economic impact assessment, and those are really the two bits that we also want members to be feeding into as well. So we're looking at setting up monthly meetings for an hour, um, and we'll be circulating documentation around and ahead of those meetings as well for the members to review and come to us um, and feed back into. We have got an internal Somerset Council Officer Steering Group set up that are feeding into the process that had their first meeting at the end of August, and so we're looking at replicating that with members specifically to give you a voice to feed into the project as well. So I'm um, happy to take any questions. Any questions? Yes, Councillor Mansell. Thanks. Um, good, pleased to see this. Um, uh, it's important, uh, important work, so, um, you know, very pleased that it's progressing. Um, so my only questions really are just a little bit concerning the detail of the, uh, the task and finish group. It mentions that uh, in the um, uh, terms of reference that it may be comprised of approximately 10 nominated members and there could even be additional ones on top of that as well. I've not necessarily got a problem with that, um, but I do observe that um, it's, it's sort of unu it's perhaps unusually large. Uh, there's a guideline in the constitution which suggests three to five 
would be um, would be uh, a, a typical size, but uh, clearly, you know, there may be reasons to have um, to have more. And the, the other question is sort of part of you know getting on with it. Um, and so I'm wondering when the the members are going to be decided. And I, you know, can we even do it today? Um, those who are interested from the uh, scrutiny committee can. Can we start taking, you know, uh, those who are interested and perhaps decide those ones? Um, again, fine with, you know, additional uh, from um, from the wider council membership, uh, which the chair would decide. Um, so that could that that could follow. I, I'll go back to Jacob on that. Yeah, um, just on the size, the kind of um, around ten was a, a recommended size in terms of a task and finish group for this project. We were conscious we didn't want to exclude anybody from it obviously prefer members from scrutiny committee but we didn't want to exclude wider members from it as well so that was the reason we've gone for that but obviously we're not going to go too big so it will depend on who volunteer um, originally when this was a very packed meeting we were just going to present and ask for volunteers to come forward post the meeting but I'd have to pass to democratic um, service colleagues on, on whether we can start that today or not I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that Councillor Hophouse. Mr Chairman, could we get the volunteers today, now, and then we'll get the list put together and we can get on with it then? I'm okay with that. I, I don't see why we shouldn't ask for volunteers now. Yeah. I, uh, it's, uh, we've got uh, a few more people in the room now than we had at the beginning, so uh, it's a fair representation. So I suppose I ask for volunteers to join this task and finish group. Just, just, oh, it's three. Yes, thank you. Oh, you put your hand up to speak. Before I ask for volunteers, sorry, before I ask for volunteers, actually, the, I, will take, I will take more questions because um, uh, we've also got Councillor Michael Dunk online. But I'll come to you first, Marcus. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was, yeah, I mean, as it happens, I can understand Councillor Mansell's concern that 10 people is quite a lot because... Um, is only, yeah, this is one subject that an awful lot of people have an awful lot of opinions on and an awful lot of layman's knowledge and then an awful lot of, mis I don't know, knowledge that maybe isn't correct. So um, maybe 10 would maybe help to balance that out a bit, but um, or not balance it out, or at least give everybody that opportunity. Um, and I think this is quite an important topic. What I was struggling with when I was reading it was trying to understand what was excluded by the scope, because... I don't know, maybe I'm just not bright enough anymore, but um, it was prescribing the stakeholders involved in the development of the energy plan. I was struggling to what is excluded from the scope and um, to understand that. And the other thing I think was, because of course, how does this then feed into item nine on the agenda um, with regard to the new local plan and how will that work, bearing in mind, it says here, a green and more sustainable Somerset, I assume by sustainable, are we including nuclear in that? Probably not, I should think. Um, but um, I think that's probably my two main questions. It was, yeah, how, how, and I suppose another question is how in detail are we going? Um, are we getting it down to, you know, the nitty gritty or is this going to be real high level stuff? And, you know, you know, for example, are we having wind farms or not, et cetera, et cetera. That's not suggesting that I do like wind farms, but um, you never know. Um, uh, well, Jacob, can you can you answer that? Yeah. So around the scope, what we mean by that is we've already procured a consultant that with the scope, so we can share that with the task and finish groups who understand within the scope of the project. So it was to say that we can't go beyond that because we've already appointed somebody. Um, in terms of your point around agenda item nine, I'd have to pass to whoever's presenting on that. I'm afraid. Um, and in terms of detail of, of the energy plan itself, it's it's fairly high level um, to go into the nitty-gritty would have gone required a lot more budget than we have and so we've gone fairly high level with our mapping so it's not to say there is or there isn't wind farms it's to say these locations are suitable for wind farms and that's what we've mapped and, and we'll share with the task and finish group thank you yes please do and apologies if this is in the budgets the other paper later on with budgets and things but um do you have or can you let us know what the budget is of this group A budget of the project itself, you mean? Yeah, I, I can. So the, it was a combined budget between the five previous climate teams and planning policy teams, and it was just under £100,000 fiscal. 
continue to work. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can I just ask a question before I leave? Would this task for this group just be limited to this committee, or could it invite others from outside? I mean, other councillors. Yeah, happy to have other other members from outside this committee join. Because I, I agree with what Marcus is saying. In a sense, there's the ten ten could be could be a lot. In view of the number of task and finish subcommittees and committees that we all find ourselves on now, it's very difficult to volunteer for more. And I think a smaller a smaller unit. I think uh, I think Dave mentioned that as well, didn't you? Um, might might be more productive. Um, but let's see who volunteers. Um, so on that, I'll bring in Michael Dunk. Mick. A quick question, Rich. I mean, this is a really valuable piece of work, and um, it's uh, it, it's going to be needed, um, you know, as soon as it can be achieved, really. The, the, the question I was asking was about assets, and uh, I think we all assume this includes um, Somerset-owned land, and Somerset owned built assets. But does this scope include uh, the commercial developments that various district councils and possibly um, Somerset County Council have picked up on the way before becoming unitary? So um, are they included because either um, just the ones in Somerset, if that's what's decided, or all of the assets, because, because we own them, we have a responsibility uh, to, to if they are suitable, I think, to put, say, solar on the roofs or whatever is um, required uh, or presents itself as an opportunity. So um, would uh, the officer be able to comment whether those will be in the scope or not? Yeah, so um, I will check, but I believe it's all assets, but only in Somerset. We're not mapping outside of Somerset. I will come back to you, just double check that. Thanks, Mike. Um, yes. Just two points. One, yes, I mean, this is one of many pieces of work. Every, uh, a lot of the work we do has to come together in terms of uh, informing the local plan in response to um, uh, Marcus's question. Um, and agree with the point Jacob's making, apart from we do kind of classify certain things as commercial investments. So we treat those as commercial investments with that slight caveat to what Jacob was saying. I, I'm, I'm preparing to ask. I'm oh, sorry. Okay, Adam Boydham. C Councillor Boydham. Thank, thank you, Chair. I just want to check that the high-level renewable energy assessment will not, not exclude the potential for solar on, on roofs, be it commercial buildings, residential south-facing buildings. There will be a high-level assessment of that. That's obviously a big p potential there. Yes, all solar opportunities, yeah. Not, not just for the farms on buildings as well. Yeah. Thank you. Any more? Yeah, OK. Well, I, I think this is a really important and influential task and finish group, actually. Um, and um, I, I'm, so what I'm going to suggest, unless there's any great objections, is we open the up, up to the, this room, um, this committee, for volunteers to start with, and then see if other people, uh, Michael Dunks online or anybody else, any other councillors, would like to be in it. And I'm prepared to say uh, despite what's been said, maybe up to 10, on the assumption it might not get that far. Yeah, happy to be led by you on that. That's absolutely fine. I mean, I don't know if any other councillors suggest, you know, you've made alternative suggestions. Do you object to what I've just... I think, I mean, I think I probably came across as being against 10, where actually I was just suggesting that it could... I haven't got any objection to going up to 10. I'm putting my hand up, by the way, as volunteering first. <laughs> Are you? I, well, what's, well, the task and finish groups. What, what about... I might as well achieve something as a councillor. <laughs> I laughed. Um, uh, Dave, would, would you have any great objection to, to that ceiling? I'm OK with, uh, with, with 10. I was just... Yeah, yeah I, think it, I, I, think, I think a slightly smaller group would be ideal, but let's, let's, let's go to that. So can I ask um, for volunteers? I mean, you're most welcome to, to consider this at length and then get back to Jacob on it. But can I ask for volunteers in the first instance? One, two, three, four, five. Keep your hands up, yeah, keep your hands up, please. Well, it's a healthy group already. Yeah. And we've got Councillor Ashton online. Councillor Ashton online. Well, OK. Um, I don't know how we're going to uh, decide if anybody... That's eight. That's eight. 
We've got, um, I don't know how we're going to decide to keep it down to 10. I'm, I'm quite wrong on that. Um, I think we might have to ask for volunteers, but limit it within each party grouping. If, if we have 15, for example, come forward, we might have to ask the party to nominate their chosen candidate. I think that's okay, isn't it? I think that's all right. Yeah. Okay, Jacob, thank you. Thank you. So. Well, I've got another question. Oh, yes, okay, go on. Yeah, I'm just curious, because obviously you said we've got a consultant in place, and I don't want to name him because it's in the report. Um, but was there much, I mean, how did we choose a consultant? Was there, I presume there was a procurement process, and how, and yeah, yeah, basically where, how they marked and how, yeah, how did that work? Yes, yeah, so um, we went through the procurement process through Somerset County Council. Um, we had a, mem a group of officers from planning, assets, and the climate change team that came up with the project scope questions, um, and then we put it out to tender, and we had seven or eight different companies bid, and then went through the evaluation process looking at the quality of questions they provided, previous work that they'd done in the area as well, and obviously price as well. Thank you. I'm ready to move on now if everybody else is. Um, um, item, uh, agenda item seven. This is awards for contracts for highway services. We do have a public question um, from David Regwell. Is he online? Yeah, he There's somebody waiting. I think he's dropped in and out. Okay, if, if you're there, David I'm Regwell, operating. would you like to ask your question now? Local Thank you. Fixed line routes, bus routes. Um, so it's really interesting for in both services that the operators are able to see whether there's impact on their services. Ligny, as Louise will tell us later, also runs some traditional by the ride and other community transport services. If we can look a little bit more in depth at the... Yeah. Um, at the, at the Sorry about that. We've, we've so we've Ligny, um, which is the area we're going to look at in more depth, um, has a total population across the area of 8,000. Sorry, you've got a cross line there. Would you like to ask a question now? Okay, if he comes back on, I'll come back to him. All right, let's um, let's move on with the presentation then, and, and I'll I'll bring him in at the end if uh, if he's if he's back online. Right, it's um, is Sarah Stanistreet here? Oh, she's online. Sarah, are you are you taking this one? Oh, good morning. Good morning. Um, I think, good morning. I think it will be Mike that will be taking us through, Mike or Dad Jones. Okay, sorry. I saw you sit down. I, I, I didn't realise why. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, morning. Good morning, members. Um, Mike O'Neill Jones. I'm the uh, Highways and Transport Commissioner for Somerset Council. Um, I just wanted to give you a run through of um, what we're doing with our suite of highways contracts for uh, a new suite of contracts for highway services um, there are a number of decisions coming formally to executive over the next couple of months um, to award contracts so we felt it was a useful opportunity to update you on um, the overall strategy I guess behind these these contract awards um, we won't be going into the details of the contract awards themselves today uh, those are in um, the, the, the confidential stages of, of um, contract award so we won't be able to, to dig into the details but obviously those will be considered by the executive at the appropriate time um, so next slide please so um, we we have an existing uh, term maintenance contract we call it with milestone infrastructure um, and we have uh, a separate contract for highway lighting at the moment um, and both of these are due to end on the 31st of March uh, next year um, we've been through a long process of um, trying to understand the best way of delivering these services to come up with a, a procurement strategy and a delivery strategy, which I'll talk you through. Um, the upshot of it is that we're going to replace the, these two contracts with five new contracts. So we're going to break down the, the highway maintenance activity into um, its kind of sensible um, sub-areas. So there's the more routine highway maintenance which covers um, activities such as uh, grass cutting, 
um, emptying drains and gullies, uh, providing winter service, particularly you know, the, the, the winter gritting service um, and the emergency call out service, 24 hour service that we run, which is obviously incredibly vital for the authority. Um, at many times in the year, particularly where we have storm events or flood events, you know, where the, the, these are the contracts where <laughs> people go out and uh, move trees out of the way in, in, in the middle of the night and um, also deal with flooding issues, so they're very important contracts. So that's the highway maintenance contract, and that's the first one that's coming up um, for discussion at Executive uh, next month. Um, and then we have um, some contracts that we will be awarding for the main areas of treatment, so the servicing of the highway, um, that involves a lot of activity in terms of going out and uh, structurally um, you know, digging out the highway and putting in new surfaces. Um, surface treatments, so this is more around the kind of surface dressing type activity where you um, do tar and chippings to, to, to maintain the lifetime of the, of the, uh, of the highway. Um, and then a separate contract for new highway assets. So at the moment, uh, we sort of mix up the maintenance activity with the creation of new assets, and actually they're very different types of activity, very different um, sort of cost pressures, etc. And we're finding we're not getting a great deal of cost predictability using the maintenance contract. So we, we, we are planning to set up a, a, a bespoke new assets contract for the uh, for the creation of, of, of new works. Um, so this this would be new new crossings and and cycleways and that sort of thing. Um, and the aim of that is to get greater cost predictability. Uh, and then finally, we'll be uh, awarding a contract for highway lighting, but we'll also be wrapping in, now that we're a unitary authority, a wider set of uh, illuminated and electrical assets that the new Somerset Council has to maintain. Next slide, please. So just by way of, of background, um, what we're actually trying to achieve here, we've done quite a lot of work on, on our our really amb ambition for these partnerships going forward and our, our objectives, which I'll talk you through. So the broad ambition is really, uh, first off, covering the basics well. We, we really want good basic service out there, uh, good quality, good value for money, um, good social value um, to be realized through the contracts, and then particularly um, a, a big emphasis on trying to reduce carbon emissions and, envir and deliver environmental improvement through the works. So that's what we feel are the, are the, the basic things we want to see. Um, we're very keen to get more of an intelligent clienting model going here. At the moment, we have outsourced quite a lot of the decision making in terms of the, the nature of the programs and the standard of the works done. So um, part of the reason in breaking the contract down and, and um, uh, ha having that wider range of, of people delivering for us is, is so that we can bring back in-house some of the, the guiding mind behind some of this stuff. So we'll be strengthening our asset management team in-house. Um, and then obviously there are some, some very uh, keen ambitions that we want to see in terms of um, uh, you know, getting more investment in, in, in Somerset and working with these uh, organizations to attract more funding into the, into the area. Um, we really want to see commercial arrangements that work for us, that drive genuine innovation. So um, quite often you find yourself in difficult con contractual relationships where it's, it's uh, a lot of time is spent uh, dealing with disputes, etc. So we're really trying with these contracts to, to, to avoid some of that. And so we've simplified them. We, we, we've, we've put in less uh, stuff that you could have a dispute about, if you see what I mean. Um, so trying to avoid lots of complicated key performance indicators and things like that and actually just looking at the basic service. So we hope that we will, will get contractors on board who are um, making a reasonable margin uh, for the work that they do and not tied up um, in, in all, a large number of disputes about uh, various matters. So that's, that's the hope. Um, and then obviously, as I've said, working more directly with the supply chain. So this is um, quite a key uh, ambition for us so that we, we feel at the moment because there's a there's a kind of management layer that's outsourced between us and the current supply chain that we, we don't at the moment have those direct conversations and quite often we miss some of the innovation and, and new ideas that that supply chain has. So, so that's really what we're, we're trying to achieve by breaking this down and, and contracting more directly with people. Um, next slide. 
please. So uh, the commissioning intentions for this work, um, I think I've talked about most of this actually in the previous slides, so I won't go through this in detail. Um, yeah, that's probably more or less a reiteration of things I've already said, so if I carry on to the next slide. So the commissioning process that we've been through, um, so uh, we, we're obviously aware that this contract was coming to an end um, uh, next year, so we've, we've done a lot of work in the run-up to that, starting back in 2020, actually, um, looking at our options. Um, there's a wide range of, of ways you could deliver these types of service. Um, and we had reviewed all, all of the options using um, a, a Future Highways Research Group options toolkit, so this is kind of an industry um, standard piece of work that a lot of highway authorities are doing, that really looks at all of the in-house options, all of the, the options for external uh, delivery, outsourcing, having arm's length delivery companies and those sorts of things, so really wide range of options. Uh, and that led us to, um, to the conclusions that we've got about how we want to do things that I've, I've just laid out for you. Um, we, we had a long, hard look at how we did the previous um, contract and, and learned some lessons from the things that worked well and things that didn't work so well from that, and we've built those in. Uh, we've undertaken a value for money review, again, using a, a, a sort of standard toolkit that uh, authorities have been using. And then we did some market analysis. Uh, so we, we employed a company to go out and talk to the market to see what, uh, what they were doing, whether there was an appetite for uh, for delivering services in our area uh, and delivering under the sort of models that we were talking about. Um, so that really demonstrated that there was a, a, a good alignment between what the market was trying to do and what we wanted to do. Um, and then we went into some market engagement. So we, we invited um, all of the, uh, the large players in the highway sector and, well, anybody was invited, but we, we invited the large players and they were all there, but there were also some smaller companies and some more local companies, uh, and really talk through what we're trying to achieve, and, and, and then that enabled us to optimise our, uh, our approach. And we also had a peer review process with Hampshire. Uh, so Hampshire, obviously, um, quite similar to us in terms of uh, the, the sorts of things they're delivering, they're a bit bigger, but generally uh, have the same issues and pressures. So it was a very useful peer review process that we learned a lot from in terms of finalising how we were going to, to set out our contracts. And then we prepared the, the contract paperwork, and now we've uh, spent the last uh, six or seven months going through the, the process of inviting tenders and, uh, and evaluating them. Next slide, please. Uh, so, yeah, just to reiterate what the objectives uh, of this were, so we, we are going to be gaining more control over design and delivery and a stronger client asset management uh, team and a, a stronger asset management approach. This is all about selecting the best standards and, and locations for treatment. Um, we'll be getting that more direct relationship with the supply chain, reducing the outsourced management of subcontractors, um, and enabling direct discussion with the, um, the supply chain to get that innovation through. Um, we're going to have more bespoke arrangements for the delivery, delivery of new asset schemes, looking at greater cost predictability. Um, we have specified this to enable us to incorporate a wider range of, of unitary council services as we go forward. I think the, the actual scope is very highway maintenance focused at the moment, but has an opportunity to be flexible and introduce new services uh, through discussion and negotiation with the contractors. So if we, if we decide there's a particular area of unitary council service that, that's relevant, that would, would be best delivered through these contracts, then we can do that. Uh, in due course. And then we've got some explicit requirements within these contracts um, for carbon reduction. So we, we put a, a, a massive emphasis in the, in the evaluation and selection process on the ability of these organisations to, to deliver reductions in carbon emissions. Uh, we've really looked at their, their track record um, in terms of the, their ability to participate with us in this. Um, and there are some really good ideas coming through from the tender proposals about how to reduce emissions, both in terms of innovative materials, new working practices, um, alternative fuels, uh, greater efficiency. So there's a wide range of things that have been considered in, in order to reduce carbon emissions. Um, so that will be a really uh, 
good part of this um, this service delivery going forward and something which we've uh, been really keen to build in. Um, next slide, please. This just sets out for those of, of you who may be newer to the council than others, you know, the, the service dimensions, that it's just to reiterate that this is the largest asset that the council owns um, in terms of its scale and its value. You know, some, some big numbers there in terms of the, um, the size of, of the carriageways that we're maintaining and, and the footways. Uh, we've got an equal, um, an equal amount of rights of way as we have to, to carriageway almost. Um, and a large number of, of structures, bridges, drains, uh, etc. So, um, yeah, a, a big service, and I just wanted to, to get that across to people. And then, next slide. Yeah, just, so just going to go into some into more detail about the decisions that are coming up. Um, we are because we're having this this stronger client asset management uh, and design function. We are two peeing some staff back in from the existing contract, so that is happening uh, over the next couple of months um, in advance of the, uh, the start of the new service next year. Um, we are then going to have a series of contract awards, so coming up first is the, uh, the term maintenance contract, which will be uh, considered by executive in um, October, so that's an eight-year contract with an, an option to extend for a further four years. And then coming up in November, executive, we will be um, subject to having having completed the necessary due diligence, which we're currently in at the moment. I think we're, we're currently on track, but, um, uh, you know, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm confident those will go to November, but the, the, if, if we don't, then we, we might need to, to sift them out a little bit. Um, but the those contracts will be the surfacing, um, surface treatments and new asset frameworks and the highway lighting contract. Uh, there will be a new collaboration board put in place to um, to manage the coordination between all of this work because obviously we there's a, there's a big task to do there in terms of if you break things down and um, contract directly with uh, with a lot of organisations it's then how you make sure there's this collaboration and coordination across that uh, activity so there will be a new board put in place with all of those contractors sitting on it with us to to do that collaboration and coordination. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think this is the final slide, just to give you an overview of, of our um, highways uh, operations at the moment and the, the highway managers who deliver the service. Next slide. So I think that was probably it. Um, yeah, that's the final slide. Thank, thank you for, for listening. So I'm happy to answer any questions uh, on any of that. Thank you. Thanks very much. <coughs> um, Okay, we'll go, I'm going to the um, committee for questions first. Uh, Bente, Councillor Height. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I'm, I'm almost got a nervous breakdown by seeing that you were touching uh, um, uh, highway lightning, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, because I rely a lot on uh, working as a good councillor for my community, I, I need highways and I need to be able to get hold of them. I'm full of admiration for the emergency uh, people that turn up uh, all hours. They are really doing a fantastic job and they are always happy and they are always cheerful when you come across them in, in, in a dark evening. So I'm full of admiration. But I would ask you, please, 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 the minute you have decided who is doing what, will that be sent out so for instance, me as a councillor, I know exactly who I am to get hold of now. I also think that regarding potholes is an, is an expense that has been dragged on far too long. I know it's not your fault, I know that it's subcontractors, but in the future there must be somebody in Somerset Council that knows about tarmac, that knows how to do the job properly even if it means you have to employ your own group of five men that can come out and then make something that lasts more than a year. It is very frustrating for taxpayers as well. Uh, so please provide with as many information about the people you need to contact to get them out and then also keep it within so taxpayers are not going to feel so sad about all their money going for new potholes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So um, I think the 
I appreciate with, with a large number of contractors coming on board, this could be seen as an increasingly confusing picture, but very much it's about um, strengthening the council's in-house service and then for those people to be dealing with the, with the contractors. So very much communication will be via the, the Somerset Council Highways team um, and we will make sure the, the contact numbers for those people are, um, are well advertised and um, so that people know who they can get in touch with within the council. Um, also, we will continue to have the, um, the emergency um, duty people who, who can be contacted at you know, 24 hours a day and, and there'll be clear lines of communication into those people. So um, don't, don't worry, there will, be, there will be clear communications and it will be through Somerset Council rather than you having to go to contractors. Um, the, um, in terms of the, uh, yes, the ability to do the work. So, you know, we, we've selected these suppliers based on, um, on, on their, their track record and their ability to deliver the, these types of works. They are all specialists in their areas. So we, we have been reviewing the quality um, and their ability to deliver as part of this, this process. So we, we don't have any concerns that they are not, you know, appropriate uh, resources to be delivering this work. Thank you. We've got Alan Bradford first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of questions. First of all, your grass cutting. Will there be any improvement on what's happened in the last year? Because some of these, some of the advantages and things that have been done is intolerable. And when you leave it so long, there's only one thing going to happen when you do cut it, the drains block. And that's another six weeks, getting the drain cleared. And that's how it goes on and on and on. This rewilding, is it, is it becoming law? Because it looks absolutely dreadful. We've even got town centres with bits of that now, as well as the villages. That's the first question. Thank you. The second one is, I was in touch with Clean Surroundings at Sedgemoor beginning of the week. I didn't, I didn't hassle Councillor Mike Rigby because he had enough hassles down at my net and after seeing him last Saturday night, uh, after a bike ride, oh, that was enough looking at me. So uh, I went to the surroundings and I questioned the fact that none of our side roads in lanes anywhere at the moment are being sprayed the verges. You, you might have pavements there and you've got curb stones and the verges are extending the width of my book and twice as much some place. You can't, you can't distinguish the verges from the from the foot of rubbish that's growing out the side everywhere. So when it rains, what happens? You all know that. The things that drains just don't work. Now, Roundup has come into the question. I did question somebody a year ago on this, actually. They said that they were going to start using vinegar. I know the cost of Roundup has doubled in the last year. Being a farmer, I used a bit of it myself, not much as I used to. And it looks atrocious. But what clean surroundings told me, they had they had contracts to do all the A roads and certain p little way into the villages, but not all the way down to the roads that matter, because some of this, some of this is getting in an atrocious state. It really is, especially here. We just had a growth year with all the rain, and it does look awful. If you want to see something, go from the main road A38 to North Pennant to North Newton. And if I had 50 sheep, I could keep them outside the road quite easy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bradford. Um, I've got um, two... Sorry, Mike. Hey, sorry. Oh, David, sorry. David. So, yeah, I, I feel I should answer this one as the Service Director for Infrastructure and Transport rather than Mike, who, who does the commissioning. So you're asking very specific questions, Councillor Bradford. So on, on grass cutting, this has been asked many times, and I'm, I'm, I'm not apologising. I'll give you the, the answer that's actually on our website. We do two cuts, and we cut... Uh, effectively, we don't cut all of the verge for, obvious, for, for trying to maintain some degree of species-rich um, environment. So we cut the first metre or two metres, depending on what the road is. You can see on the website, we say which lengths of road we do. We try and do the first cut between about April and June and the second cut between August and September. You're absolutely right. Uh, sometimes the growth rates are different in different parts of the town of the county. It just depends on the weather. But obviously, when the contractor is uh, instructed to do those two cuts, they can't do every road at the same time. They have to start somewhere with the gangs they have, do the lengths of road that we've prescribed. Minor roads get one cut, again, sometime between June and July, um, because that's, that's what the policy set out. And um, 
I'm not here to defend the weed growing. That, that is a consequence of a conscious decision that was taken years ago that we would only weed kill noxious species, which we have a legal duty to do. And this is true of many authorities who have stopped spraying um, weed killer on just generally uninvasive species, you know, grass, etc. So that's, that's the reality of what, what we are, and that's what we're funded to deliver. It's all right, but I, I, I just on the issue of Roundup, if I may interject, I understand that it's highly car carcinogenic and we shouldn't be using it. Do you mean, glyph sorry, Chair, do you mean glycophosphate? Sorry? It's a dangerous chemical and uh, it's something we should be avoiding to so use it for, as far as I'm aware. Discussions come up before, Chair, about glycophosphate, which, which is included in Roundup. Uh, there, is, there is, I'm not going to say there's evidence, there is, a, there is a suggestion that you can find information that says it's carcinogenic. Uh, there is other information that says it isn't carcinogenic. We still do use glycophosphate because it's the only thing that we can use on um, noxious species, which we have a legal duty to get rid of, Japanese knotweed, etc., in ragwort. So, those, those things, we do use glycophosphate, but we use it very limited and very sparingly, and obviously not when it's about to rain, um, on those particular species. As I say, the rest of it, we've stopped spraying weed killer generally on verges and, and um, uh, channels. Thank you for that. Henry. Uh, Mr Chairman, I have a whole series of questions on the different contracts. So I'm going to start off by, on the highway maintenance contract, are we looking at letting this internally or are we going to be going uh, outside and have we done the figures on the internal teams and the external teams and why um, um, what is the difference in price because at the end of the day we've got certainly three teams in the district who have been doing this job for a long time and frankly I don't think they need replacing okay, I'll take, uh, I will take each of your questions in turn so can we deal with the last one first about the, the, the ability to insource it? So the contract that we're letting for term maintenance is an outsourced contract to a contractor, but there is no guarantee of workload. Um, and therefore, progressively, we can decide whether we deliver internally or externally. Those, those conversations um, have started to happen between services, between my service and Sarah Dowden's service, who are... Uh, um, and communities they deal with the public realm to decide, particularly in urban areas where they are very active, whether or not take grass cutting, for example, that the DLO would do the grass cutting for highways. So those conversations are already happening. We'll come to a view about what's optimum. We will obviously have a price, Councillor Hobhouse, for grass cutting, to take that example from our contractor. We can then compare it with what the in-house cost of that might be through the existing DLO. So those moves are afoot and we'll see where it fits best in terms of both service delivery and financial efficiency. Um, I just, sorry, I'm going to turn my mic off. I, I think it's important that we keep some form of DLO because in 2014, when we had the floods on the levels, our team were working 20 hours a day out of Lufton, and if we don't have them and we have another series of floods like that, you've got no staff to do anything. I don't think there are any plans to cut the DLO. I think there's, there's long-term plans to probably reinforce the DLO and its role. Okay, moving on to the next contract, which for me is the potholes. The 2010 contract had no guarantee in it of the quality of the finish of the potholes. And for seven years, we lived with a contract where if they came up again, they got paid twice, if not three times, to mend those um, particular potholes. Um, I'm sorry to say I have a little bit of knowledge, which is probably a very dangerous thing, but um, I could spend a lot of money and mend a pothole permanently, so it never needed touching again by using hot tarmac and bitumastic and proper cleaning out of the pothole and cutting the edges, all of which will give you a permanent thing. I understand you need to do a cost of um, uh, work out which is 
the most cost-effective way of doing it. So my first question is, what is the guarantee going to be on the potholes on the new contract in years? So um, on the new contract, it, it is the same guarantee level as the old contract. So you're right, if a patch is being cut in, uh, inlaid into the surface, we would expect that to last three, four, five years before we surface stress, etc., or, or resurface permanently. If, if it fails, um, and we obviously have a record that we instructed the patch to be put in or the, or the pothole to be filled. I think, I, think, I think filling potholes is an unfortunate term because it's a bit more sophisticated than that. We have to cut into the sides and we lay possibly two different sorts of material in the said pothole. So it's a bit more complicated than just, just pouring a cake mixture into a hole. Um, and if they fail, um, we, we get the contractor to come back and do it again, which, which we often do. I think maybe what you're referring to, Councillor Hobhouse, is that because we were inundated this year, particularly in March and April, with a huge amount of potholes, we allowed a temporary fix called Viafix, which does look like putting a cake mixture into a hole. It's an epoxy-based material. But progressively through the summer, we've been taking out and retrofitting proper patches, hot mix <coughs> patches that we, we put in over there. But of course, I think everyone hopefully would accept we had no choice. We have a statutory duty to fill potholes so that, that you can transit the road. We had to use Viafix as a temporary measure until such time as we caught up and started putting hot mix material back into those holes. So that process is ongoing. It's obviously not helped by the weather we've been having at the moment, but we did catch up pretty much with where we should have been by the end of August. My understanding on the 27 extension of the 2010 you brought in a two-year guarantee on pothole filling. Is that still the guarantee period, or are you looking at four or five years? I'll check specifically what the, what the contract term says. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's so cut and dried as two years or five years, Councillor Hobhouse, but we'll check and we'll, we'll respond to you in writing. Thank you very much. The second question I've got on that specific subject, um, and every single councillor here will have seen it, uh, you get a pothole which is marked in blue because it was done four weeks ago. You then get, you know that the pothole filling, sorry, wrong term, the pothole mending team will be coming out. If then you get another one done at the week before in red, they deal with the blue one, they leave the red one because it's not been marked out or um, agreed to be filled, wrong word again, agreed to be mended. So you end up with the team coming back to the same point four or five times. Can we please have some system which allows them to fill the new potholes when they come to do the old potholes so they're only visiting a site once? So uh, the, an the answer to that is yes. And um, this year, so if you just go chronologically, Councillor Hobhouse, we were inundated. We couldn't keep up with hot mix fixing of potholes. And your, the different colours are to do with the categorisation of the level of defect. So um, therefore, you're right. You might often see red or yellow writing and, and blue writing. Um, one's a category one defect, one's a category two defect. So there has been this issue, and the lead member um, has, has, has had the same discussion. We got some additional funding from the DFT, about 5.4 million, a proportion of which has gone into exactly that, Councillor Hobhouse, which is going to areas where, although the statutory defect isn't quite deep enough to, to classify it as a class one defect or a category A defect, um, we are now taking the steps to fill the other ones at the same time. And that's all because we've had more money from the DFT to do that particular piece of work. So yes is the answer, yeah. Great, thank you. Have you got one more? Yeah. Oh, thank sorry. You. I'm sorry. Um, I'm willing to be shot man at this point. Uh, as far as I know, hot filling is a lot more um, better you don't like the word filling. Hot mend, using hot material to mend potholes is considerably more permanent than cold filling. Um, and the sealing of the uh, side of the um, pothole with bitumen then waterproofs it, and you don't get ice frost lift on that um, hole. Yet, if you look at the CO2 levels and the carbon levels, that is nearly three times, I think I'm right in saying, the CO2 value because you've got to keep the material hot and you've got to do all the rest of the stuff to go with it. Are you concentrating on 
lowering the CO2 or more permanent, I can't think of another word at this point, fill of, or mending of the potholes because uh, the two are completely diverse in the way they operate. For me, the more permanent filling means you haven't got to come back and that is cheap, cheaper in carbon terms than having it lifting after three or four years. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot in that. Um, I know. I'm trying, I'm trying to un un unpack it a bit. Um, I think, I mean, I, 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 I'm maybe not answering your question, Councillor Hobhouse, but yes, there is a problem we have with highway maintenance in general in terms of the amount of carbon that we use, both, both in transporting material, embodied in the material. I mean, you are effectively burning diesel to lay bitumen and you're heating it up with gas. So it's not, it's not exactly um, you know, a sustainable thing. Um, Mike's actually leading a project that we have called Live Labs, which is looking at decarbonizing our highway maintenance overall. That is the type of thing that we will be asking our contractors to do. I think the other problem we have in a damp climate is that we also use gas to dry out the hole before we fill it. So there's another bit of carbon that comes in. That may be doable with electric dryers. We, we're seeing more and more electrification of plants coming in. We'll, we'll see what's possible. And that's exactly, I mean, Mike, if you want to comment on the Live Labs trial. Yeah, I, I mean, just to add that I think um, we, what we want to do is quantify the issue and say where is carbon emitted throughout the whole process and, and over the whole lifetime of an asset. So from going to maintain it and then how often you have to replace it in the future. So exactly the thing you're saying, um, there will be there will be a balance. Um, and I think we, the idea is to uh, to assess and come up with the best solution that, that has that best balance over reducing the um, the emissions in applying the material and then reducing the emissions over the lifetime of having to go back and repair it. So um, we will be analysing that and coming up with the best option, but I think that the, there's a lot of new materials coming out and a lot of new innovation. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily going to be as straightforward as a, a colder mix is less, um, has less longevity. I think you know, th these new products are, are going to hopefully balance out the two, but we will we'll work it through in an evidence-based way. Come back just on that and I've finished. Could you please bring the results of that back to this committee in a paper so that we all understand what the balances you're having to do to achieve the result? Yeah, I mean, we have, this is a three year program we're running, so it, it might not be back to the committee uh, very soon. It's, it's a lot of, of complex stuff to analyze, but yeah, certainly over the, over the period of this project, over the next three years, we can certainly bring something back. I, uh, these, these questions are very specific, but I'm letting them run because as you're in the process of awarding, we're in the process of awarding contracts, it's all quite relevant. And as councillors, this is something that arrives on our doormat all the time. So if this seems a bit detailed, I, I think it's quite important. But I, I'd like to move on to, to Mike Rigby because he, he wanted to uh, come in on that. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to remind members that the Live Labs program was something that we bid for. Uh, and we were really pleased that we ended up with, I forget, was it five or seven million pounds, Mike? Remind me. Five, Councillor Rugby. Five million pounds. Um, there were only a few councils across the country that were awarded this money. The idea is that we go out and trial various methods, and we've picked several different types of route uh, across the county, rural, urban, large, small so that we've got a good cross-section of the kind of roads that we are required to maintain. And that money will be used to trial in, in partnership with, with a couple of other councils to trial these new methods that we hope at the end of the process will be uh, a bit of a trailblazer for the rest of the country to follow. So uh, it's, it's a really useful thing that we've been able to do. Uh, and my congratulations to, to David, Mike, and, and the rest of the team for being successful in that bid. Uh, and I hope that it's, it's something that will at the end of that process give us here and lots of other councils a really good indication about how we're going to maintain roads in the future because for all the reasons that we've heard about gas being at the foot of pretty much everything we need to move away from that and we need to do it quite quickly thank you i'd just like to add a supplementary question myself if i may there and it's maybe something i should know but when government funding comes to this council does it take into consideration the sheer quantity of roads I can, I can give you a bit of an, uh, an explanation on that. I might call on David to add to it. The, um, 
Yes, in, in a nutshell, the, the length of road is part of the factor that the government uses to, to hand out money to local authorities. So Somerset has one of the, the longest stretches of, of road, if you like, the total road. It's 6,600 kilometres. Uh, it's not as much as Devon. I think Devon has the most of, of any council in England, but we're pretty close to the top. That is taken into account. I think one of the difficulties that we have is that in recent years, government has chosen, rather than giving local authorities any real autonomy as to how they spend their money. It's incredibly prescriptive. You get to bid for a pot of money that does a specific thing, and then they're even more specific about what you do with that money when you get it. It's not a particularly helpful way of operating. Um, it, you know, I've started to characterise it as really not us not being local government with delivery agents for central government because they tell us exactly what we've got to do with every last bit of money um, and that that i think will need to change in, in years to come but at the moment that's the situation that we we have to operate under david i don't know if you've got anything to add in terms of uh, how money's allocated yeah so that that's generally and um, chair um capital spending that that mike's referring to so there's a there's a formula that the government have for length of road state state of the road etc which they look at all highway authorities and then they grant us capital grant for maintenance for highway maintenance what what the government doesn't fund us for is revenue maintenance that's that's done from our own from our own sources of funding from council tax business rates etc so over the years obviously the squeeze on revenue budgets has meant that we, we, we try to capitalise as much as we can because that's the budget the government gives us. But it's also difficult, given revenue budgets over the years, to, main, to do the day-to-day -day maintenance, something, something I think uh, Councillor Rudd was talking about in terms of drainage clearing and gully clearance, etc. So the, the idea is you have enough revenue maintenance that your capital, your capital works over uh, five, ten years. You have a steady state, um, a steady state of asset life. That's the, that's the theory of how it's supposed to work, and that's what the government fund us the capital funding for, but they don't provide revenue funding. Well, thanks. So I've got Marcus, uh, then Edric, and I see Dave, and, um, and Gwil Wren is online. So let, let's move on, please, Marcus. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm getting more befuddled as the questions came on, actually. I would like to just point out that other weed killers are available doesn't have to be wound up. Seems to be getting a lot of mentions lately, but like, there's an argument over which one's the best, I suppose. Um, and I don't, I mean, where, and apologies for if some of these questions aren't quite agenda, well, agenda led more to, more about the presentation actually, but while we've got both David, Mike, and Mike, and Mickey in the room, I think it's worth maybe sort of asking some of the questions, because, um, so, and I think one of the things, one of the questions I sort of, you touched on was, the decision making more the decision making more in house so that means it's outsourced and i wondered how that actually worked with the outsourcing of decision making um and so then who decides um i've got another question here which i just wrote down which was who decides on the high you know on highway servicing who actually makes that decision is it is an outside consultant is it somebody inside um another question and i won't come back again i'll just get them all out of the way i suppose um Things like, obviously, we've got these contracts here. Things like, I don't know, the Coombe Lane in Withercombe, there you go, got it in a community, got it in a scrutiny meeting straight away. You know, um, we talk about how many roads we've got. Well, we've got we've got half a kilometre less now um, after after what happened at the weekend. And so when things like that come up and a road not quite disappears, but it's not really a road anymore, it's more of a, I don't know what it is, but it's not, it needs sorting out and sorting out quickly. Where does, that, where does that money come from? Do we have a contingency fund? And then is that done by a, is it done by one of the contractors or do we have to suddenly go out on a quick bidding process? I was trying to get my head around that, I suppose. Um, I've talked about, and um, you talked about the supply chain and dealing with them more directly. Um, by supply chain, do you mean the actual contractors or do you mean, I don't know, people who make streetlights? Um, you know, there's probably a street light. Well, I know there's a street lighting exhibition. There used to be. Um, is that what you mean there? And I suppose I'm going to leave the rest because I'm conscious of time. Um, but I'm looking at this and all the effort that goes into this contract, into these contract awards, etc. At what point do we get to the stage? Well, actually, if all that effort was into running our own highways maintenance department that did it all, would it be a better use of public money? than actually spending all our time and energy and all your time and energy awarding contracts that actually 
if we weren't awarding the contracts and you were getting best value doing in-house. Um, I assume, I mean, I always assume maybe we're legally obliged to, and whether that's a political decision that's been made in the past by others. Um, so I wonder whether, what point are we getting to? And, you know, an example, Somerset Building Control Partnership? Fantastic, get making money. Um, you know, it was doing very well. So I wonder where we are at that point. And are, a, are we at a point where we just go out and buy by a, by a company that's already doing it and take it in house. There you go. There's the questions. Okay. So quite a few questions there. Are you okay with that? Yeah, I think so. We're between the two of us. Um, the we start with your last question first because it then leads into nicely into all of it because you started at quite a detailed level and got on to very strategic. So we'll, we will answer it the opposite way if that's okay. So the decision was taken for strategic reasons, actually to have more control so that we'd have more, if you like, client side. There's a discussion about an intelligent client. The previous contract we had, which, which predated, um, certainly predates me, and Somerset Council had a very, very outsourced contract with Atkins, I think 20 odd years ago, Mike, and we've, we've progressively moved towards more in-house. So that is a direction of travel, a journey. We, to go full in-house, you'd have to be absolutely sure that you had the management capability to run a contractor. Now, you'd be relying on people coming from, your, from the existing contractor to you to be able to do that. That is a step beyond where we think it was reasonable to take a risk. So we've ended up in a situation where previously, the previous contractor had a large overhead, so that they, they did the four contracts in one. That's effectively what, what they did. So we've disaggregated them, and that means that we save on the management overhead of the contractor because we are instructing the sub, what were subcontractors. So there was a surfacing subcontractor, a surface dressing subcontractor, and they often subcontracted um, capital works, new build capital works, like a building a footway cycleway was, was subcontracted to a local contractor. So if you remove the management overhead and you go direct to those contractors, you save a lot of money, maybe 5%, 10% of the contract cost, depending on what the management overhead is. And we now need to take on the programming of that. So we previously did the design work. So our asset management team would explain, this is to answer your first question, what needed to be done on our network and where. That then went to our current contractor to design. And they then designed it. They booked the road space. They programmed the works. And they went out on site. What's changing is that we're going to do the design internally from our asset management's instructions. And then we are then going to individually to the surfacing contractor say to them, here's your program of work for next year. And we'll talk to them about when they can do it, but we'll be responsible for programming on our network, not the contractor anymore. So those are the kind of fundamental differences from the way we did it last time. It is a step towards in-housing more, but more, moreover, I think what Mike introduced in, in his speech was that we wanted to have more control over what we, what we did. And also, particularly on design, for example, Live Labs is a good example, to be able to do, to do design differently and try different things, A, to be more efficient, and also to see if we can reduce carbon. So does that, does that answer your three questions? Uh, I think it did. There was, the one about, there was the question about where things like Coombe Lane and Wither can fall into existing uh, contract, et cetera. Money side and who does it and how that works. I mean, and I suppose, you know, it's like, and then designing. I suppose when you talk about designing, you talk, I don't want to mention individual companies. No, I'll leave it at that for a minute, but that, that is particular, how that then works. So King, the King Lane, contract you got. the photographs you sent me, yes? I'm doing my bit as a division council and getting out there. Yeah. So, but yeah, those. Yeah, I think we have to move away from individual cases um, on that, but did Mike really want to say something? Very good example, Mr. Chair. Yeah, okay. I'll just respond to that point that Marcus has raised very briefly. I, by coincidence, about four weeks ago, when the weather was very much better than it now is, walked up Coombe Lane to Withycombe from Carhampton um, and marvelled at the vast amount of new drainage infrastructure that we'd installed uh, about a year earlier. Um, none of it is there anymore. It's pretty much all been washed away. And I think it's an indication of the fact that we aren't going to be able to engineer our way out of the problems that we've got. There's going to be a degree of adaptation required, um, short of some massive national program to increase the capacity of our drainage systems, which would involve, frankly, Californian-style storm drains in some locations. There is no engineering solution to this. So we'll, we'll look at Coombe Lane and, and try and get it back into action as quickly as possible using our own resources. 
but I just want to get the message across that with the kind of weather that we're having now through climate change, engineering is not going to get us out of this. Uh, thank you. Uh, as I say, that, 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 that's, a, that's a general comment rather than a specific one. Um, are you coming back on that directly, Henry? I was stationed in the Army for a year in Hong Kong. They've got the biggest drainage system you can have on their highways. They seriously flooded this week, and I mean seriously flooded, like nothing we've had in Somerset. And trying to engineer your way out of any of the climate change is not possible, even if you're a Tory. Well, we try not to, to make politics too much of an issue in this uh, committee, but uh, thank you. Thank you for your observation. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Edric. Thank you very much. I think the conversation has moved on from where I was going to um, mention some things, but I'll just leave it to one point. Under the new contracts with um, maybe the highways teams, who um, do people go in check on the status of signs, etc., in, um, in terms of overgrown road signs you know i know we've got we see our maintenance guys out in small vans because i frequently find myself on what we know is the mendant motorway going out chopping back vegetation from important signs such as stop signs and chevrons and i'd like to see in in terms of maintenance things that sort of snagging done so people like me don't end up doing it or do we just report that through fix my street and then wait six weeks for it not to get fixed and have a major collision at a, um, at a crossroads thank you yeah, so this is this is a regular um, discussion, and um, it's 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 complicated by the fact that quite a lot of the hedges where the signs that you're referring to are not ours, and they're cut by farmers. So we can and we do where there is a sign obscured and a farmer hasn't cut the uh, the, the hedge, we do cut them back. We have the power and authority to do that. We obviously don't necessarily have the resources, the manpower, and the funding to do it everywhere. So I actually saw an email exchange this week, Councillor Hobbs, which is on exactly this question about enforcing the duty of um, landowners to cut their hedges that are adjacent to the highway. It's not straightforward. Some are very good. Some are pretty lax. Um, so the answer is we do. And if you report it online, we will go out. If the resources are available, we will go out and we will cut that back. I think everyone would accept there's probably not enough of it from 20 years ago when it was probably much done more routinely. So it, it's, it's just a consequence of the, the amount of resource that we have to deploy. But yes, if you've got one, please report it online and the team will get round to it. Yeah, I think, Ben, did you want to come in on this point? Please, I just wanted to say that um, uh, in Shepton Manor, we've got a lot of, of house, houses where the owner thinks that they, they can now let everything that grows in the garden go wild, so it goes wild on the pavement, so we can't walk there. Now, I did not invent it, anything about going wild. I think it's despicable that our old township in Madrid looks like a tip, but I will say that when I can't walk on the pavement and it is hanging over my head and my glasses fly off, I grab hold of that offending branch and I pull it down. I will take photos out in the open and I'll send it to, to highways and they will get to us as soon as they can. But inside the town, if I can't get hold of the owner, I will just pull it down or break it off and then they will have to come out and get it. And that I have always been told by Mendip officers that I'm not breaking any law. So rather me than highways. Uh, good, thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about ownership later on if we've got time. Um, I think uh, it was um, Dave Mansell who's next. Thanks. Um, yeah, I've got questions in a couple of um, areas, both to do with um, uh, the strategic objectives. So we've touched on some of them, so I'll try and limit it down. Um, I think the first one w uh, will be on um, sort of the, the commercial aspects. Um, uh, and I will start by saying that the, the intelligent client, I like, like the sound of that, that, you know, that I, I, I'm pleased that you're, you're, um, you're, you're doing that. Give us a bit more control and understanding um, and input into the design of, uh, of things. Uh, long term, I tend to incline to have, having things in-house, but do accept it's not as easy, simple as that these days, especially when you've lost it and no longer have the management ability. Um, but uh, so 
you're heading in good directions. Um, there was something in the report, it's um, page 25, um, and, and it talks, uh, though, about um, maximising income from commercialisation, uh, which sounds like something else. Um, so I did wonder what exactly that, that meant. Um, um, so if, if, you, if you could let us know a little bit more whether there's something even further to this that isn't, uh, isn't clear to me at least um, so far. Um, and still though in the, in the more general area in the intelligent client and the way the contract's working, I did just wonder whether what, I'm sure you've done risk assessments, I'm wondering what risks might arise from this. Um, the fact though that we're um, not guaranteeing work suggests that loan gives us quite a bit of control, although um, I'm not, I, don't, so I don't know how, but anyway, uh, uh, perhaps if you could just say, you know, are, are there any risks that we should be concerned about with, with this newer uh, approach? Um, you know, but clearly we've had problems in the past. Uh, you know, is there anything we need to keep an eye out by, by changing things that we might be exposing ourselves to? So that's one, sorry. And then the other one, you won't be surprised to hear is in in relation to the um, uh, the, the, the carbon ambitions in terms of uh, reduction, um, and yeah, good, good. I'm pleased to see a 50% um, reduction, especially for this type of work where it, it's clearly challenging and the work does need to be done right. Um, and you've you told us some about this, so you may have already sort of touched upon most of it already, so that's fine. But is there anything else in terms of how that um, carbon reduction aim of 50% might be achieved that you could also let us know about? And very finally, I realise that part of it is um, how the vehicles are going to be fuelled and do just wish to check where we are with that, um, not least that we can now see the missing bit of the slide from our pack um, where electric three and a half tons and we've been on this before uh, what, what what is meant by the alternative fuels for uh, for larger vehicles in this context please yeah and I might I might need to draw on uh, Dave Peake as well for this so um, just to give Dave the heads up who's online so I think we um, Commercialisation is, is an ambition, and we had it in the last contract as well, but it didn't really come through, where we asked for proposals for how the contractor would help us um, generate some income from the assets. Uh, and something we've done ourselves, for instance, recently is um, start to introduce um, advertising on, on roundabouts as making use of the, of, of the highway asset for an income stream. But that's something we've done ourselves. So it's that type of thing, really. It's how, how, how do you get an income and I don't think it, we're talking about huge sums but um, we did ask the question through the through the process and it was part of the evaluation uh, criteria it wasn't something I personally evaluated I know they scored um, you know we, we've scored each of the, the contractors on this and the preferred contractor will have scored reasonably well on this as part of that process but Dave is there a flavor of the sorts of things that you're aware of that, that have been discussed under commercialization without going into enormous amounts of detail What your communities are like? Yeah, and, and there, is, there is a specific offer on commercialisation from the contractors as part of the tender process. So what I'll do is, um, I think once we've gone through the process of awarding the contract, and obviously certainly the, the ones that are coming up for executives, I'm very happy to set out for the committee what the commercialisation offer is, so that you can see, you know, in, in detail what actually will be will be there, because there is a clear offer. And unfortunately, I'm not well enough. Um, briefed on it at the moment to have gone into that level of detail. But we certainly have the information I can supply it. Okay. Uh, you talked about risks and carbon. So if we do risk first of all, um, we had a piece of work done by a firm of external lawyers who were re reviewing the contracts. This was about November 2022. And they identified that a key risk for us was having the institutional capacity to do the programming necessary for the four contractor co contracts to work together. So we were aware of that risk. We've been working on it um, and proposals. One of them is to have clear visibility of the works program, both the, in, the, in the 
next year and the year after. That requires a, a bit of getting ahead in terms of what we're going to do. Uh, Marcus's question is the is the obvious one. Well, those sort of things happen. You know, we have weather events which we have to change. So there's a balance between how much we can plan to do and through programmed works and how much we have to react to. Um, we never probably have enough capacity to react across everything that happens, but we obviously do our best. People work long hours to do that. So that was the main risk, Councillor Mansell, that was identified, was the ability for us to program. So one of um, network management, because this all works together, it's not just highway operations, we, well, everything has to work together. Network management under Bev Norman are looking at a GIS system where both members and officers can see the whole programme of works across the whole network. And, and that will have dates, dates and times, et cetera, when we're going to undertake works. We're also trying to do that to aggregate, perhaps, um, developer works at the same time as we do a resurfacing scheme. So we only go in once, and that will help because we're going to put on all planning applications that are coming up in Section 106 agreements, et cetera. So there's, there's a broader piece of programming work we're doing than just the strictly necessary programming. I hope that gives you a bit of confidence that, yes, we understood that and we knew that we needed to, to get better at it. It's a constant problem um, in terms of people asking us, why is this road being dug up? Did we give prior notice, et cetera, et cetera. On carbon, I'll just give you a statistic, uh, Councillor Mansell, which was surprising to us when Mike and I heard it from some of the um, experts that are involved in our live labs bid. About 60% of the carbon in highway maintenance is just vehicles moving people and stuff around. It's not actually materials. So you asked a very good question, and I'm going to take the opportunity, um, Councillor Mansell, to, to, to share with the scrutiny committee that there is things that we can do, but it will require behaviour change both on behalf of the public and ourselves, and it obviously requires a political decision whether we want to go down this road. One of the things that would reduce carbon is a concentration of works in a particular area because you obviously don't have to move the plant around. You also can potentially have mobile recycling plants where we plane out um, the material. We put it in a, you know, in a friendly farmer's field. There's a machine that recycles it all and we lay it down. That would obviously cut out a huge amount of journeys to and from the quarry if we're recycling on site. But to make it efficient, you have to have a concentration of works. So. The, 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 the point would be that we might in one year do a lot in South Somerset as we're, as we're here today and do more in the West area one year and more in the East area. But the way we've structured the resurfacing contract, it's very much for the contractors to tell us how they might achieve that. We will then work back with you as members to say we could reduce carbon on this scheme, on this programme by 20%, but you will have to accept longer works, for example, because... The sections that we actually do works at the moment are quite short. Obviously, longer sections mean longer diversions and more, more encumbrance for the public. But I'm afraid there's a balance to be struck. If we want to reduce carbon, we probably have to accept some of those things as a net consequence of doing it. Dave, you want to come back? Well, yes, part of it's not been addressed yet, but, but thank, thanks for that. It gives us something to, uh, to, to think about, so I perhaps won't explore some of the thoughts that proceed to mind. But, yeah, clearly something we should potentially uh, look at. And often, if things are programmed in and you can see what the logic of them is and you know that you're in stages, it becomes more <coughs> acceptable and the, the change can be done. But, but there's more to it than that. So interesting and sounds like a discussion that should happen. Uh, could I... Then just to, on the last bit, on the, the fueling of the, the vehicles, which it sounds like where most of the reduction may be expected. Yeah, so again, the, we've been agnostic, which is why we use the word alternative fuels in the, in the descriptions we used in the, in the contracts. And the way that the contract works, you've got this target of 50% that we've put in there. It will be for the contractors to tell us how they're going to achieve that and us to, us to accept their proposals or not, as the case may be. So the course celeb of HVOs, for example, Dave, we've concluded that we aren't going to accept HVOs as, as um, carbon mitigation because it's actually trucked around in diesel trucks. It's a bit, bit strange, so we're not going to accept that. But we will look at alternatives. All the vehicles that they have to use um, under three and a half tonnes, they'll be probably electrified. We've we made that a requirement of the contract. Um, they, we will work with them to put infrastructure in place in the depots to enable them to be charged, etc. But for the for the above three and a half tonne vehicles, this is the knotty problem that we have as to what is the alternative fuel source for that. Is it electric vehicles? Is it hydrogen? 
probably in the time scale of this contract we'll come to some conclusions of what works and what doesn't work um, for that. But again, you know, it, it, concentrating the works helps if we have to carry on using diesel for the foreseeable future, certainly for, for heavy vehicles, obviously reducing it overall. But that, that's where we meant on alternative fuels. We are agnostic. We'll see what they say. But we have, just to reassure you, Councillor so we have the right to say yes or no to the proposal. Yeah, very quickly, if I, if I may. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's OK. That, that, let, let's see where it takes us. Pleased to hear you've got the yes or, or no. Uh, and and please the position you're taking on HVOs because I think that is the right one and that's an, an example of how you, you can get it wrong and how in the past in Europe we got it wrong on diesel vehicles and made a big mistake um, and signs were a big mistake or a perhaps a smaller mistake was being made on HVOs and um, so the yes or no is important uh, and the last bit on that just demonstrating that because I've raised that I read the biomass strategy which the government uh, published um, earlier this year, it might have only been during the summer, and they've said HVOs are not right for transport in there. The, the little bit, it's a paragraph, but quite clear for the reasons that have become apparent. Um, uh, so th there's often more to it, and, and carbon's important and a big driving factor, but sometimes there's something else going on as well, and you can be causing a bigger problem elsewhere by too narrow focus. We have got to keep the wider view as well to make sure we're not making a, a mistake because that, that can happen and it's not easy. Uh, so I'm, I'm on the whole reassured and interested to see where it goes. Thank you. Thank you. I've got, uh, Alan Bradford, was that a separate question or did you want to, just supplementary to what's just been spoken? Is it supplementary to, to what we've been talking about? Okay, I'll bring you in afterwards then. Um, Dixie Darch, did you want to have a quick uh, uh, come in on that. Yes, thank you, Chair. Just um, I, I want to kind of follow on from what um, Councillor Mansell has been asking. Um, I think it's, you know, we're kind of in, in early days around carbon reduction, uh, regrettably, and there are those kind of wrong turns, if you know, that, that, that have kind of happened. So I think we have to be fairly flexible. What I'm really pleased about with this contract is that we, we know what is deliverable in terms of carbon reduction and we've explicitly asked for it it's not just a kind of procurement process where we say you know we'll we'll choose the contractor who's going to say what they're going to do around carbon reduction so um, you know we think that 50 percent of carbon reduction over eight years is is doable and vehicles under 3.5 tons can be electric so i think we've we're being really proactive in, in this, but um, there is that kind of uh, fluidity and negotiation within the contract that if the contractors feel they can do things in, you know, in a different way to save carbon, we can, we can go with that. And I think that point about the distance travelled by vehicles versus making them electric, ex expect, especially when you factor in the embedded carbon of a, of a new vehicle, I think that's really an important one. Often it's about logistics rather than snazzy new stuff. Um, and uh, as David Carter was saying, there may be impacts on that in terms of how things are done, and that's kind of a political decision, and it's stuff about behaviour change and uh, helping people understand how things go. But, you know, as we move forward, if you just think about potholes and the weather that we have been driving here, well, it, the, the old business as usual model kind of has to change. I don't, don't think we can do things in the way that we have been doing, really. Thank you. Right, thanks. Now, I'm before we go, I'm not going to take, uh, I'll take some more questions from the floor later. This We've run this for a long time. Um, wouldn't have had time for the water debate, would we? Um, uh, so I'm going to go to Gwil Wren, who's on the online, and then to Mr. Regwell, who's been waiting a very long time. So Gwil, first, please. Okay, th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, and uh, I'll try not to detain you too long. Um, very interesting to see this, and um, I, I think, as as a councillor from a rural ward. ward uh, where highways are something that always comes up in parish councils, we'd be looking for a sig significant improvement. I mean, I spent this morning trying to update my list of highways issues, 
uh, which I started a year ago, many of which are long term standing and not many have been solved. So we're looking for a significant improvement. Um, one point I would be very interested to know is if the uh, the streetlight contract is going to the existing contractor, I'd be very disappointed because the service we've had from that has been truly appalling. So, as I say, we're looking for service improvements. Now, the, the mention was made of an intelligent client. Well, I'm, I'm always a great favour of intelligent client, but I think that does include councillors as well because we need to understand what the service standards are, what is achievable and what isn't. So I'm hoping that as part of this package, there will be a full briefing for us so that we can be part of the communication of what's going on. I think we all understand that one of the biggest frustrations is, is poor communication when people don't know what's going on. So it was really interesting to hear about the GIS proposal so that we can in as far as possible real time actually begin to understand when a job is going to be done. Also, I think the the prospect of aggregating jobs in a particular area is, is useful. Um, but if you're going to do that once every year, then who, if your job's down in year four, then we might have some problems. But I mean, I'm sure we can work through that. Um, Back to the service standards, I would hope that the, uh, there are sufficient penalties to keep the contractor up to the mark. Um, as we all know, the previous contracts have drifted a little bit, and I'll leave that one there. But of course, the most fundamental problem is budget. Um, and I would like to know whether the budget we have is just fixed and will get taken up on a first come first serve basis or whether there is a more um, nuanced way of calculating what we're going to spend on highways, um, because clearly we don't want to spend all our money by the end of September. That would be a disaster. So I'm, I'm hoping that there is some sort of management in there that actually there is liaison between ourselves, our officers and the um, contractors involved. And the final point I want to make is that we must support this internally with, with appropriate mem members of staff. All our highways teams are struggling. I mean, they've got so much to do. They're running around um, and, you know, this is part of the problem. So we do need to get more staff resources in. As in the flood team, the flood team is ridiculously under-resourced. As that last weekend saw, we, we you know, these events are not uncommon anymore. Uh, in our part of the world, we're still waiting for the Section 19 report to address the problems. And that kind of information is integral into what highways works follow on. So if we actually don't understand what the problem is and the cause of the problem, because we have a resource issue back in the council, then it does make addressing them in the longer term or the shorter term much more difficult. Anyway, I'll leave it there and thank you for the opportunity to talk and I'll watch this with interest. Um, if anybody wants to come back on some of the points I'll raise, I'd be very interested. Thank you. Thank you, Quill. Um, any answers, please? Well, let, let me go with uh, Mike Rigby first. Thanks. I'll just make a general point about budget. Now, Councillor Wren's raised the issue of budget uh, as a key constraint and he's absolutely right there. Um, it's something that we continue to bang the drum for with government. Um, I was up yesterday uh, at the House of Commons doing the same thing there. The problem is that on the current trajectory, w within a couple of years, Somerset Council will be a care hub. We'll have enough money to do adult and social care and not much else. And every other council, upper tier council, is in the same boat. So we are all between us lobbying government to change the way that local authorities are funded, all the way that care is provided. He can't carry on as it is, you know, we'll continue to do everything we can within a very constrained budget. This council spends 63% of its entire budget every year on adult social care and children's services, and that leaves all of those other, which, which are frankly universal services, all of those other services fighting for a share of the remaining 37%, and the social care element rises year on year. So that's the picture, that's the environment that we're operating in, um, and that will continue to constrain the ambitions that we might otherwise have. Good point, thank you. Do you want to come back? Yeah, it's just on Quill's service levels. I think that the service levels for the new contract are broadly the same as the old contract. There are penalties and incentives in the, in the contract. I, I think that, that, again, there's always a caricature of service delivery, that it isn't 
sufficient to what most people would think. I, th I think we're highly aware of that. 25 years ago, it was very different. We had far more people and higher funding. So Councillor Rigby just told you that to a degree, the service is a function of the resources that are available. And I think that to manage expectations, whilst we would hope the new con contract and contractor will be, um, you know, will adhere to the contract, I'm not sure it will fulfil fully Councillor Wren's expectations of almost on-demand service. We do programme and we can share how much money we apportion to reactive maintenance. Um, and as Councillor Wren said, sometimes, yes, that is spent up by September because of events that happen. We end up in a situation where we still have to provide the service from a statutory perspective, so we end up overspending. That, that's just the nature of the way the service works. We have a bad winter. So we, we do allow a proportion of our spending for reactive maintenance, but some years it's enough, some years it's not. But that's just the nature of the way that we're funded and resourced. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on and uh, find it first. on the point of a briefing for councillors so that we can be part of this process going forward. I think that would be very, very helpful if we understand what the service standards are and where we can help. Um, yes, I'll, I'll leave that there, I, but I, I'd yeah, like yeah, to leave it I with think, David Carter if we can do that. We've got an answer on that. We're, we're, we're OK with that. Yes, we, we, it, it's been a, approved. Um, call in Mr David Ridgewell, who has been waiting on the line for a long time. We did try to get hold of you earlier, Mr. Reginald. Are you are you able to present you, your question? If so, could you could you keep it to three minutes, please? Thank you. Maybe you've got your microphone off, because we can't hear you. question hasn't been submitted we can't hear so I, what I'm going to suggest to you is uh, if you could write your question in the chat box that would oh you know, you're probably you're probably on the phone I think we can be in contact please send in an email or a letter and we'll answer it then thank you I had two I think two more people wanted to speak to the floor on separate issues and that I'm, I'm then nailing this discussion it's been very valuable but very long so Alan was the first was there someone else Oh, yeah, Marcus, okay. Well, actually, um, we brought up floods, etc., cetera, Carhampton area on the weekend, and we had a lot of publicity last week, but the whole of the state, and Councillor Kravis and Councillor Rigby are the two nearest counties. Any, any news on that? Did that work? Did, that, did all them logs end up in one heap or not? After cause of the volume of rain you had. Can you fill me in on that? No. I think what the estate has done there is to try and the river back to the conditions it might have been in before it was engineered the idea is to slow the flow of water between the upper reaches the steeper slopes and the, the sea now i haven't seen what's happened in bossington i think it's it's horn of water isn't it and the river alla in particular that they've been working on but i i'm not aware of any particular flooding issues in those areas so uh yeah as far as i'm concerned i, I think what they're doing has worked although the aims of their of their project are wider than just flood prevention. There's a whole um, habitats and, and nature conservation element to it as well. But in terms of flooding, I, I don't think anything particularly happened in Bossington. So yeah, I'd say it was a success. Thank you, Marcus. I'm very impressed with Councillor Rigby's knowledge. Um, very good. Got his finger on the pulse. In fact, the first I knew about it, it was going to be on BBC Breakfast was when I saw it. So um, yeah, th I'd just like to say, th first of all, thank you because obviously, you know, you, yeah, this is almost, we could have been a one item agenda meeting really to have a chat with you or et cetera. So thanks for that, thanks for your answers. Um, it was on the carbon reduction actually. I thought Dixie obviously, you know, put, her, put the point across and we get back to, um, get, get back to um, Henry's potholes and carbon reduction. At what point, can we sort of talk, think about carbon reduction credits? I mean, obviously, we've got all these skills we've discovered with phosphates, and once we just solve that issue, maybe there could be, is a way we could do, um, you know, mitigation. Um, because one of the things that we can talk about potholes, and we can talk about um, how we do them, etc. 
but obviously the public has was shown, you know, it's maybe why one party is thinking of rolling back on some other environmental policies in the near future. Um, don't really care. They care about the potholes sometimes. Um, so how can we do that? And one question, and we talked about street lighting here, and it's more of a getting back to the basics again. Sorry about that. At what point are we to having street lighting that is no longer needed to be connected to the grid and to the and to um, you know individual street lights that will actually do the job and actually not require electricity? So therefore, you got a carbon reduction there, and so there could be that whole package. I just more of a question on out of interest really on that one. Yeah, interestingly, the, the Live Labs program that, we're, that Councillor Rigby was talking about that we are part of um, one of those. Live Labs projects elsewhere in the country is, is on precisely on highway lighting and how you create uh, an illuminated environment without having to spend energy on it. Um, so I think, again, it's a three-year program, but there should be some um, learning from that that becomes the industry standard in due course. So yeah, high hopes in two or three years' time, there should be some, some really good innovation there that we can learn from. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to commend uh, the department on, um, <laughs> on the managing to get such a high percentage of lead lights into our street lamps. But now we seem to be, technology seems to be moving on even from that. But we've come a long way since I first became a county councillor and we were just replacing uh, the bulbs that were, were blowing with, with leads. And now we have a policy which actually recognises it's actually cheaper to, to go through the, the mall, which is great. So thank you for that. Um, I think we're there on that meeting, that, that particular agenda item. Um, I, I'm going to... Oh, I'm sorry, Dixie. Um, thanks, Chair. I just want to come back quickly to uh, Marcus about kind of the mention of carbon credits, I think. I think it's probably a conversation that is not to do with highways, but certainly we're, we're very aware of opportunities, particularly around biodiversity net gain and um, county own land and we're kind of looking at that there's a lot going on with the a and obs uh, as as well around kind of blended finance on nature recovery projects and um there's you know there's there's lots happening but it's early days and and obviously um the kind of phosphate mitigation issue is a bit up in the air at the moment until we've got further clarity thanks Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm sorry, I can't take any more questions. Um, uh, it's appropriate, I think, for us to take a five-minute break, if we can make it as quick as we can, before we deal with the last two issues. Thank you.
what happened? Ch chair give way, did it? Thank you, everyone. I'd like to um, carry on with the last two items of the agenda, please. Um, there's a f I'm sure the officers will be in in a minute if they need to be. Um, we'll call them in if, um, if they need to be uh, asked questions. OK, moving on. Um, item 8, which is budget monitoring update. And I think Christian Evans is doing this. Oh, there, there he is. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I didn't realise you'd moved. Thank yeah, you. Sorry, move from over there. Thanks, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. So, my name's Chris Evans. I'm a strategic manager in finance. Um, so hopefully, there's a couple of slides. Stephanie's going to just pop up on the, on the screen there. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so, this is the climate and place budget monitoring position, uh, month four to the end of July. Uh, from an overall uh, corporate perspective, the forecast outturn is predicted to be uh, 26.1 million overspend. Uh, the majority of the overspend relates to adults and children's services, as was kind of mentioned earlier by, by Councillor Rigby. From a climate and place perspective, the forecast outturn shows a £2.7 million overspend against a budget of £87.7 million, so that represents about 3% of the budget. Uh, but this is actually an improvement of £2.4 uh, million uh, from, from month three. Um, from a waste perspective, so with regard to waste services, the forecast is an overspend of 800,000. Waste services were able to negotiate an improved pay award shared with Suez. So this provided further pressure on the budget, as you should imagine, but actually, however, it did avoid uh, strike action. Uh, there was additional impact of the King's Coronation too, and there's been an incre increase in uh, residual waste and both curbside and recycling centres. Uh, highways, there's a forecast of £1.3 million overspend in highways due to increase in safety defects, which is kind of mentioned as we've gone through the morning, and that's across the whole road and wood uh, network. Um, and there is a 400000 predicted overspend in economy and planning. Uh, this is a once-off pressure due to how the funding from DWP uh, can be applied to the apprenticeship levy. If you could move on to the next slide, that would be great. So some of the key risks, future issues, and opportunities. So as you would guess, at the moment, contract inflation is a huge risk, uh, certainly for some of the, the larger contracts, such as highways uh, and waste. So for example, um, two of the contracts in waste uh, have um, indices relating to October and February. As you can imagine, inflation at the moment is extremely high. This will have a knock-on effect to a lot of the contracts um, that we have. Um, the impact of cost of living crisis at the moment with spending habits and decreases in income budgets will probably have an effect on the income, uh, sorry, income and expenditure for um, the economy area. Uh, staff vacancies across, actually, across the whole authority at the moment, uh, there is a lot of difficulties in recruiting permanent staff. Obviously, this then puts a greater um, pressure on uh, the costs for agencies. As you can imagine, they're far more expensive uh, than employing them yourselves. Uh, and as has been discussed this morning, uh, one of the key risks is change in the climate, lots of flooding, highways, icy conditions, uh, and safety defects, which obviously do cost a considerable amount to fix. So, happy to take any questions on the paper. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Councillor Hobhouse. first one is a point about the actual document, page 8, where whether it says this has been driven by unusual mild damp weather, this year propagating plant growth. Propagating means you're breeding, and they need to use the word increasing plant growth. You check your dictionary, Jamie, if you want to. <laughs> um, the second one is much more important. Um, the I cannot understand where we knew that we knew were going to have to do a highway contract that we are had to put an extra overrun in the budget because we should have budgeted for it of 0.2 um, 
of a million in month three to do the data for the highway contract. It, it seems like one follows the other. If you've got to do the work for a highway contract, you should have budgeted to spend, have the money to do the data for that contract. If that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking I, I would like to know why it wasn't in the budget. A, that's a highway question, really, isn't it? Yep. Uh, uh, Mike's, Mike's gone. Uh, but David might want to answer that one. You've got an overspend of 0.2 of a million in the budget this month due to having to do data work for the highway contract. Why wasn't it in the budget at the beginning of the year when you knew that you were going to have to do the highway contract? And um, so <laughs> it's a fair question. And the answer is that because of the way that the directorates, um, or certainly my service directorate, has been structured, previously the funding for that came through commissioning. Um, and, it, and it wasn't an operational function. Commissioning doesn't exist in the same sense anymore within within the directorate, so it's been pushed together. So there would have been an overspend, we just didn't know where it was going to be. So it ended up manifesting itself in the financial year and it's effectively through the operational budget. Okay. Why did you budget for it in April? Because at the time we didn't quite know what the cost of it was. We, were, we had some consultants work that was being done. We, we have, but the, the cost is to help us mobilize and demobilize the current so demobilize the current contract and mobilize the other four contracts. That's where the cost is going. We didn't know at the time what it was because we, we were asking consultants for a price, so we couldn't price it at the time. But equally, as I said, previously it had been part of a commissioning budget, and now it's part of an operational budget, so it's ended up being a, an in-year pressure. Thank you for the answer. Any other? Dave Mansell, and then Marcus. Okay, yeah, I'll try to be quick. Um, th thanks for the uh, the, the report. Um, uh, I might have a little chat afterwards if you're still uh, around, or we might go to just on the the presentation of the uh, the, the tables and the charts. So there's so there's good. They're good, um, and uh, you know, pleased to to see them. It always helps to have something visual. Um, possibly, it might help to have um, something from some of the other service areas in addition to to waste as well. So. Maybe that's something that could be looked at uh, in time. Um, I, I won't say any more than that on that one. So um, uh, under risks um, uh, that, uh, that that exist, um, uh, contract inflation is mentioned. Also contract uh, disputes in the, the waste area. Is it possible to give us sort of briefly a little sort of outline of, of where those are, I, I may have some ideas, but I don't entirely know. Um, or could we be supplied with a, you know, short briefing on, on that so we're aware what, well, you know, what the contractual disputes are, uh, are uh, around. And also um, staff vacancy levels, difficulty in recruiting permanent staff. Um, could, could you let us know um, are the particular service areas where this, uh, where, where this applies and which, which, are, which are they? Anyone want to answer? Would you like to answer that first? Um, probably Mickey might need to. Uh, um, <clears throat> I mentioned the disputes. Um, obviously, it's difficult in an open meeting to discuss contract, contractual uh, elements, but I'm sure we can provide a note if need be. Um, from the from the tables and charts, thanks for the feedback on that. Much appreciated. Certainly, as we bring in the five budgets together for all of the legacy councils, one of the things we are looking at is the key performance indicators. Um, so we are looking to extend these. What this this actual report stems from the executive report, uh, which is quite a full report. So, um, but yeah, certainly as as we develop the new budget monitoring process and the report that goes with it, then um, certainly we'll be adding some more key performance indicators with with obviously Nikki and the team. And vacancy levels probably again probably something that Nikki might want to pick up on. Mickey. 
that on. Yeah, um, yeah so we'll probably do a note in due course, but the commercial um, issues, is, as, as Chris rightly says, wouldn't want to go into too much detail now, but they're primarily the primarily the ones we were talking about with the waste board before in terms of our collection contractor um, reflecting the kind of commercial pressures there. So lots of work behind the scenes in terms of making sure we're kind of analysing the, the those and, and getting to a conclusion. So we'll do a note in due course. Um, there are some other things around kind of when there's been new change in legislation in terms of POPs and uh, persistent organic pollutants, which more affects the, the other side of our contracts that clearly we're working through with our, our other contractors in terms of making sure we um, protect the public purse. Um, the vacancy question, I mean, I think there are particular pressures in, there are pressures everywhere, but I think the particular pressures are in uh, kind of the, the areas which are reliant on more pro professional skills, so our planning service, our building control service, air aspects of engineering, anything to do with flooding and water, quite frankly. Uh, so I think, but I'd describe them as areas of acute pressure, if you like, because actually it's just across the board as well. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Oh, Marcus, I do beg your pardon. Thank, thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, you look at, I'm looking at this table here on page seven. I mean, actually, you look at the highways overspending is, what is it, less than 5%, 4%, 3%? I mean, it's possibly in today's world an absolute result. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, you only have to look at how much everything costs, and um, I think that's probably, you know, probably a relief, really. Um, my question, I suppose, was touching on that one with the staff vacancies, but simple question is it's got economy and planning, then it's got economic development. I'd like to know the difference between economy in the economy and planning bit and economic development, just out of a technical thing, I suppose. With regard to staff vacancies, are we losing, I mean, am I right in saying, is it tier three? Has tier three now been done and tier four not been done? I never quite, was it tier four that they just still don't quite? know what's going on i mean how far and is that actually costing us is that are we struggling with staff retention because of the because that hasn't been sorted yet and is that then costing us more money in agency fees and should we be putting more efforts into um into that it's more of a question than a it's, it is a genuine question that um because obviously how much the agency staff cost us and i think you know i think what mickey said about planning was I think that'll probably come up in the next item, actually, um, with regard to planning officers, et cetera, et cetera, and the, and what's, and the lack of them, should I say. But it's more general, that tier four, is it, that we're on on the general restructuring? Thank you. Well, I, uh, good points. I'm not sure if there's anybody in the room that can take that one up, to be honest, about staffing. And is there? You can, Mickey, okay. Yeah, so in terms of the table, what we did have a kind of internal debate about whether we presented it a different way. What you're seeing is kind of almost the legacy way that table has been presented, almost as different functions, which might have been ex district, ex county council, have come together. It's not, especially in that economy, employment, and planning area, it's not particularly helpful because it doesn't reflect, uh, so it reflects legacy rather than any kind of real split of services. So I think uh, Chris and I will look at that and kind of present that in a clearer way, which makes um, for, for next time. Um, in terms of the, the restructure, yeah, we're kind of going down through that cascade. So um, there was a consultation over the summer um, across climate, environment, and, and sustainability, empl economy, employment, and planning. Clearly, infrastructure and transport largely, with the exception of some bits around car parking and a few other bits and bobs, was, wasn't changed. Um, but yeah, so that consultation has concluded. And so I think over the next, well, it's probably the next few weeks actually, we'll be kind of progressing through that recruitment process. Uh, clearly anything that creates uncertainty has risks you know, in, terms of, in terms of staff. But I think in terms of that broader question you're asking about in terms of agency, actually it's thinking about each service in its totality. So planning has a spe specific set of issues that we want to deal with, but actually you look at that as transforming the planning service overall, not just, you can't tackle the agency problem in isolation, if you like, um, but yeah, so ongoing work. Thank you, sorry. Um, this might apply, I'm, I'm uh, another question, just, just about going forward with this in terms of waste management. Um, we've got a pilot scheme at the moment, which I've been involved in, in, in Froome, of collecting extended our, our recycling, um, where we, we get a sort of blue, uh, uh, another blue bag, it looks like a polythene bag, and we collect this, the cellophane and the wrappers, and um, 
is, has that been factored into the, the waste budget for next year for, as a rollout across Somerset? No, the reason that hasn't been factored in is that was a fully funded trial. The original intention was that we do it small scale, as you say, so it's about 3,600 properties um, on the outskirts of Froome. The in original intention had been that, it, again, a further scaling up of that to say about 15 to 20,000 properties would happen next year. By the third year, extended pre producer responsibility reforms would have come in nationally. Uh, so the whole county would have effectively been funded. So we're always clear that absolutely something we really wanted to do, A, not something you can, you can't just collect it without having the rest of the system, the reprocesses working. So that was why we had to do it as part of a national trial. But B, frankly, we don't have the money to do that unless the producers are, are paying for it. Clearly with kind of delays that were already happened in introducing those policies and what may or may not be announced but nationally kind of later today or tomorrow, there's a big uncertainty about the future. So the reality is, if we don't get the funding, we haven't got the money to roll it out further. Um, so we are, we'll, um, but if we do roll it out, it would be on the basis of be, it being fully externally funded. Thanks for that. Shame if we can't carry on with it, but I understand. Any other questions? No, right, well, thank you very much for that. Thanks for the report. Um, and we can move on to item nine, which is approach to local plan and statement of community involvement. Is it Laura and Andrew who are going to do this? They are. Afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm uh, Andrew Redding, so I'm a principal planning officer in the policy team. Um, I'm here with Laura, Laura Higgins, who is also a principal planning officer in the policy team. Um, so we're going to be got two short presentations on both the statement of community involvement and on the local development scheme, um, local development scheme covering the timetable for the local plan. I think they're ordered slightly differently in the agenda pack, so um, the other way around. So if you're looking for the SCI report, it is page 91 onwards, um, just, just so people can follow. Um, so in terms of statement of community involvement, so this is going to, both, both these documents are essentially precursors to um, uh, preparation of, uh, of the new Somerset local plan, um, the key documents which we, which we legally had to get in place um, before we, we commence preparation of the local plan uh, in earnest. Um, so the statement of community involvement itself, so essentially it's um, requirement we prepare it under the Planning and Compulsory Purchase Act 2004. Uh, it's a document which essentially sets out how the local authority will engage and consult with uh, stakeholders and the local community on planning matters. The important thing is it relates to the full council function, so not just uh, the local plan and preparation of policy documents, but also the development side, the development management side of things, so the determination of, of the various plan applications which, which the council, council is responsible for. Uh, next slide, please. So just to set out a bit of a background and context, so the reason we need to prepare one is at the moment, uh, we essentially inherited the, the five statements of community involvement of the former uh, local authority areas, both the county and the districts. So we have separately adopted statements of community involvement. Um, they were prepared at very different times. They cover different, different topics because district and councils obviously had slightly different plan planning functions previously. So there's essentially a need to prepare a, a new document which covers the new, the new unitary's responsibility on planning. Um, so in terms of background, the draft statement of community involvement as a document went before uh, Executive Committee of the County Council on the 18th of January uh, of this year. That was for a decision to consult on the draft document. Following that, we had um, a six-week public consultation uh, with the communities. It was a public consultation. Uh, and it was accompanied by uh, a number of training sessions with parish councils and the agent, agents as well, planning agents in terms of raising awareness of the document. Um, and uh, it also, as part of that, we also consulted uh, with um, the former planning committees of the councils, so the, the planning committees and regulatory committees of the districts and the county council uh, previously, we also consulted with. I think important thing to set out is that it is um, a high level document so this won't be the end of the documents which the policy team prepare on consultation engagement 
there will be more focused documents on particular areas of work. So the local plan, for example, colleagues are currently preparing a more detailed communications and engagement strategy, uh, specifically about local plan engagement. So the key thing is this is a high level document setting out the full uh, requirements over statutory consultation across the whole planning function in terms of context. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of consultation undertaken, like I said, it was a, a six week public consultation we undertook in spring between Fe February and March. Uh, it included um, uh, both public consultation generally, but also with local groups, parish, town and city councils, agents, and, and the committees I referred to previously in terms of the, uh, the former planning and regulation committees of the councils. In total, we had 164 responses. Um, that included both good mix of local residents and businesses, planning agents, parish town, city councils and, and other groups also included useful comments from a number of stakeholders, so statutory consultees on plan applications um, or, or other stakeholders involved in the planning process such as the OMB unit and environment agency in natural England and, and the like. So the final draft document which is what we're looking to take now for adoption to executive um, is essentially supported also by a consultation statement. So I will summarise some of the key changes we've made to the document in response to the consultation. But that consultation statement runs through all the comments in terms of officer consideration of comments and, and where we've considered and made appropriate changes to the statement of community involvement uh, in response to those comments. Uh, next slide, please. So just to go over some of, the, some of the key changes we've made to the document in response to the consultation we undertook. So in terms of the um, introduction section, it, it did refer to the importance of engagement with um, uh, parish, town and city councils and local groups in the document already, but a lot of the comments came back was for the need for that. There was a key importance of that in all aspects of the planning system. So we've made that very clear up front in the introduction over that expectation that we will do that with local groups and, and local uh, parish, town and city councils. So that wording has been strengthened. In relation to the equalities and diversity section, we've amended that to be to be much clearer in terms of consistency with the now Somerset Council's equalities policies over making documents available. So it now reflects that wider policy over making documents available in large print, easy read, uh, audio and braille formats. Again, it's around addressing what our, you know, our qualities and accessibility duties are around making sure that our policy documents and other planning document, documents are accessible. So in relation to conservation now, some comments came through on this. This was a, a, an interesting one in the sense that we don't currently legally need to consult on changes to conservation area boundaries set out in the legislation. But it's fair to say there's an expectation that, which came back through consultation, that we, that we should be engaging appropriately with, with local communities, not least to uh, you know, local communities understand their area, we understand the heritage elements of their area. And um, so we've, we've put included wording in the document which will clear that appropriate local community engagement will happen, not least just to fact check what's being proposed over things like amendments to conservation areas. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the key uh, things which we came back from the consultation is the area which has probably been amended the most is around pre-application engagement. So this is essentially describing what the council's expectations are for developers and planning agents to consult with the local community um, on proposals before formally submitting an application. That's now been strengthened and it's been sort of very much in plain English terms said that, that consultation is expected to be genuine and it should be early enough that it can genuinely inform planning proposals on that front. Uh, we've also, now that they've been adopted, been clear in the section around uh, pre-application fees, which we charge in terms of pre-application to the council itself and the, and the key point that um, parish or community schemes are exempt from those pre-application fees because obviously we want to be encouraging uh, uh, community schemes of benefit to, to, to be able to go through that process without being subject to fees. In terms of um, uh, how, how we consult, we, one of the feedbacks that came back from parish councils was around sometimes the statutory timescales for plan applications doesn't always align with when parish meetings are over when they're expecting when they have their planning meetings to consider applications. So we've included a section on that, which essentially happens in practice across all, all the planning areas. It's my understanding is, is that officers will be pragmatic and be able to agree extensions of time 
where um, uh, parish councils need that to be able to make substantive comments on applications. In terms of how to comment on applications, so this was more of a point of consistency in the document, so uh, we've made it very clear now in this section, which, was all, which aligns with the equality section, that comments, yes, people can comment using the planning online service, but making it clear that um, comments can also be made by email or post, um, and the details will be provided on site notices and notification letters. That comes again back to that point about making sure that we're not excluding anyone from the process in terms of people with poor broadband connectivity or like still being able to make their views heard on, on the flat application process. Uh, next slide, please. So one thing which came back which was not included in the draft document was around the process of the planning committee um, in terms of the arrangements for planning committee, uh, things like public speaking and the referral process to planning committee. That was because at the time there wasn't, the constitution wasn't agreed in terms of the constitution of the new council. So in the, in the final draft we've included um, a section on that so it's signpost to the constitution is clear regarding what those arrangements are. Um, so people looking at the statement of community involvement are referred to the, the constitution and can understand what the process is in terms of uh, decision making. There's also um, a new section on planning enforcement, so some comments did raise the point of the importance of planning enforcement and um, that it, shouldn't, it should be referred to in the state of community involvement. This varies between different councils. Some councils do include their, enforce, their enforcement information in the document, some don't. Given we've now got a new enforcement policy for the new council, it, it's quite easy to just cross-refer to that in the document, which makes sense, and we've also included details of how um, people can report a breach of planning control um, in, uh, in the statement of community involvement. And then with regard to appendices, so the appendices in the document essentially list um, uh, statutory consultees and specific consultation bodies for local plans and, and plan applications. There's been some amendments there in response to feedback received. Um, for example, there was a point was raised about whilst it's not an exhaustive list, there isn't representation on that list from horse riders um, in relation to transport. So we've, 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 we've added that. There's also new organisations such as Active Travel England, which have emerged since the draft was prepared. So there's been the need to make sure that list is up to date to reflect um, uh, current legislation over, over statutory consultees and applications. I think that's the um, end of section on standard community development. So I'll pass over to Laura now to just go over the local development scheme and, and timetable for uh, the local plan. Thanks, Andy. Um, this report starts on page 63 of your agenda pack. And the report covers two main points. One is the local development scheme and one is the establishment of a planning, policy, planning and transport policy subcommittee. So starting with the local development scheme, we, are, we do have a statutory requir requirement to produce a local development scheme. And what an LDS is, is in effect a work program of the documents we're going to be producing that make up the development plan for Somerset. So looking at that in a little bit more detail, the council also has a legal requirement to produce a local plan within five years of vesting day. So that means by the 1st of April, 2028. And the timetable on the screen is what we are proposing. It's a really ambitious timetable, given the resources that we have um, and the just general process of a local plan. It's, it's very um, involved. Um, each stage is very significant, and we have to follow a certain stages in the legislation. Um, because we are now a unitary authority, we are a huge geographical area, so everything sort of will take a lot longer to sort of, um, I suppose, analyze, come to come to um, recommendations on approaches for policy. So it's, it's a very significant piece of work, but we are proposing this timetable as an ambitious one, um, but we've tried to streamline a number of the stages as well to, in order for us to try and meet that deadline. A couple of things we are aiming to do is to have one round of formal consultation at the regulation 18 stage, and that's the early consultation stage. That will be supported by targeted engagement activities, so that could be any number of things such as going to specialists or um, local interest groups on a particular area or geographical basis or on a theme. So we're working up a consultation and engagement plan in order to 
um, work out the best way to, to get the information we need from the general public and from interest groups and from specialist groups um, and statutory consultees as well. We are also aiming that the Regulation 18 consultation will be in the form of a draft plan. So these would be worked up policies rather than an option stage document, which you may have some in, in many former district areas would have worked up an options document before a draft plan document. This isn't to say we wouldn't be working up options. We would be looking at the options at those targeted, targeted engagement activities rather than in the full consultation document. Next slide, please. So the local plan timetable, as I say, is very ambitious and lots of things can impact on the timetable. It is quite often that timetables need to change because of many different reasons. And what's set out here are some of the ones that could impact on our timetable. One of them being the MENDIP local plan part two site allocations review, which has got a really tight time scale table and it's taken resources away from the main local plan. We had anticipated we would do the work for that within the main local plan, but the High Court judge has um, ordered us to do that separately and to do that in advance. So that's had an impact. So other things that could have an impact, um, just budget and resource constraints, any other projects that come forward that take resources away from the local plan. Um, the requirement for main modifications, which could come at a later stage within the local plan process where the inspector requires more information for us, more work and more consultation. Something that quite often affects local plan timetables are the, um, the national level planning reform is being mooted about changes to the system and whether there's any um, changes in national government as well. And finally as well about the, the phosphates mitigation strategy, whether we've got something in place to help inform the local plan. Next slide please. In the local development scheme, we're proposing that the local plan is produced separately from the minerals plan and from the waste plan. This is a pragmatic approach so that if any one of those three documents had a significant issue that derailed it or delayed it, it wouldn't then derail the others. Um, it enables each of them to be updated more easily. Um, and it, it's easier to manage, I suppose, the, the the project, each of the individual projects. And at this stage, we are looking at reviewing the minerals plan and waste plan as in a, an assessment about whether the, either of those are still up to date and fit for purpose. And it may well conclude that they are, and then we could hopefully just, those would endure over a longer time period. We wouldn't need to do a full review of those just yet so that we would then focus on the local plan. Um, with regards to those three documents, local plan, minerals plan, waste plan, plus also the Somerset local transport plan, we would have a shared evidence base. So they would be very collaborative. Um, we would work closely across those teams to ensure that they reflect each other and they, I suppose, work well together to create, create a land use plan for Somerset. The local transport plan isn't a part of the development plan, so it doesn't have to go in the local development scheme, but we are putting it in there just to demonstrate how interlinked they are. Um, next slide, please. I did want to point out about climate change policies because I know it's a real critical and important issue. Um, the local plan is a key document that will help deliver on our climate change strategy and climate will be at, absolutely at the heart of the local plan policies, whether it's at the strategic level or at the very detailed development plan, development management policy level. And so we'll be looking to maximise opportunities and be really ambitious in our policies. So for this reason, we're not recommending having a separate climate change DPD document, which has been suggested in the past, but we're not recommending it because, it would, because all of those matters would be considered all together within the local plan. And also, if we were to look at it separately, it would very much divert resources away from delivering the local plan. And because the local plan is the statutory requirement, we must be focusing on that. Um, unfortunately, we're just in the situation where we don't have the resources to do both. Um, so we have to make a decision and we, you know, the local plan is our statutory requirement. And the longer we're without a local plan or an, an up-to-date local plan means the longer time we're more at risk of planning by appeal where we may get developers coming in, proposing sites and we don't have an up-to-date 
local plan to, to successfully challenge those. Um, so we've, uh, I, I suppose a DPD, I suppose on its own, a climate change DPD wouldn't necessarily um, bring those policies on any sooner if we were to um, try and bring in stronger policies because they still, the DPD still has to follow the same process as the local plan. So I suppose it's to reassure you that if we can fully focus on the local plan, that's the most, I suppose, the best way of trying to get stronger policies in place as soon as possible that are strategically considered with all the other requirements that need to be considered in the local plan. Next slide, please. This is the final slide, and this relates to the Planning and Transport Policy Subcommittee. We're proposing setting this up so that it will help our local plan process, um, making sure that we can de get draft documents approved for, co for consultation as soon as possible because we are facing a really tight timetable. Time it's also that we can make sure that we get neighbourhood development plans made within the eight weeks that we're expected to. Um, to make sure that we can get those, those on the agenda um, as soon as we possibly can. We'll also use the subcommittee to agree infrastructure priorities and approve community infrastructure and Section 106 spending priorities. And to consider other documents, um, perhaps to brief members um, and look at policy options and draft policies. Thank you. That's the end of this presentation. So if you've got any questions for myself on the local plan or Andy on the statement of community involvement. Thank you very much. Any questions? Dave. I've got a few. Um, it's best to do them separately, so could we, uh, could, if I start off with um, the uh, community involvement side of things, if, uh, if that's okay, uh, but very much would like to go on to the local plan aspect uh, too. Um, okay, on uh, the state of community involvement, um, uh, in 3.10, I must admit I'm getting lost with all the uh, different uh, papers, I think it's Appendix uh, 1. Uh, it talks there, there's um, a bit about uh, community consultation which the applicant does, um, which you would generally expect for larger um, schemes. It's just a small point, but it's often something I thought that would help, that we should encourage neighbours when they've got a small application, if they, if they just, or an applicant, if they just talk to their neighbours, Sometimes, um, you know, that would help in the process. And I just wondered whether we could actually mention that. We can't require it and shouldn't require it, but whether we could encourage neighbours to, you know, uh, applicants to talk to their neighbours about a, a plan and whether that was something that, you know, should start off being included in here, but then the most important place to say that is when they do the planning application and they get a pod to, uh, to do it. Uh, have a chat with your neighbours before you put your plan in. It may, it may help. So that, that's one, um, and the other one is to do with um, uh, publicity requirements, notices that's, that's given. Um, I've sort of got a question in this area. I, th I think I may know, but uh, I'll ask the question to make sure that I do. Um, and it's when, um, uh, again, when neighbour notifications are given for planning applications. Um, it says that they're not given to neighbours for applications for listed building consent. I think that's because you have two applications, all right, you're nodding, so they do get notified about the application, it's just the separate one on the consent which actually says the same thing, so that, that's why that, that doesn't there, so neighbours would be notified uh, of a listed building application, yeah? If, if, if it involved works which needed planning permission as well, so external works for the okay. property, um, which didn't fall under, well they wouldn't fall under permitted okay. development because they're, they're, um, they're not then, Yes, it would have an accompanying plan application. If it was a list of building consent, just and it was only a list of building consent, for example, because internally listed mm -hmm. things were being changed, then it wouldn't. But I suppose that's because they're only internal works to the property. Okay, that, that's fine, and that does answer it. Thanks. There's another one which is sort of similar to that, which, which I was less sure on. It says that applications that do not accord with the development plan. For some reason, neighbours aren't notified of those. So that one, again, it might sound quite straightforward, which I'm overlooking, but I couldn't quite understand, uh, you, you know, possibly an application that isn't in line with the development plan is something neighbours might want to know about even more, not to... Uh, so why they shouldn't be notified, 
uh, but again, I may be missing something there. Uh, and um, also on, uh, on this, it's got site notices, and no, sorry, this is a, from Appendix C, which is actually the statutory requirements, which is what it says we're going to, to do. Um, it says uh, site notices or neighbourhood notifications. That, now, we have talked about this before, and I'm just trying to check whether something is changing what has been our understanding of what goes on. And I don't know what happens in the other districts, but in Somerset, Western Taunton, in the West District, we do both, and that's the expectation. And I think it's right that both are, are done. And if we start just putting site notices or only notifying adjacent neighbours, uh, it's unfair on people if they don't know about a planning application in their area. And I wouldn't like to see something being changed without us understanding what's going on. So. I hope our policy will remain as it is in our area that both are done and I believe that's important and I'd like to see that stated in here because my reading of it at the moment is it saying either or where it should be both. On, on the point of notices, um, yeah, as you say the appendix sets out the statutory requirements in terms of either or uh, site notices or neighbour notifications. Um, my understanding is, is as, as, as yours is that actually what happens in practice is a lot of officers will put a site notice and send neighbourhood notifications um, in terms of publicity of applica application. Um, the re the S is, is listed as a statute requirements of the SCI, I suppose, because being mindful of um, uh, future resources of, of planning function, I suppose, and not wanting to, um, because the SCI sets the high level context over engagement, um, there is a risk, I suppose, of over-promising if, if the situation is emerges that actually there will be circumstances where we did an evil or. Um, I mean, the, the problem with, with this site notification, neighbor notification issue is, is, is trying to be explicit around what happens in the SCI is quite difficult because depending on the application, you could take quite different circumstances. There will, um, there will no doubt be circumstances for certain applications where only a site notice is put up. Um, I expect, you know, for certain proposals in, you know, which aren't, which don't have significant interest or of a nature which, you know, in a very rural area where, where there's no immediately adjoining neighbours who are going to have an interest. So, it, it, that's why the decision was made that we keep it in the SCI as the statute requirements. I think the point is, and this reflects a lot on on on, on elements of the document, is in practice. You're correct. I believe a lot of officers will make sure that neighbour notifications and site notices, notices are, are are done. That's certainly the process at the moment, which which a lot of planning officers adopt. Um, on the point of the pre-application, I think we, which I think was your first query, we we refer to applicants in it because, and I suppose we haven't really referred to the scale of development on that point because we wanted to. You're right. The logical thing is that applicants should be making their engagement before an application is proportionate to what they're doing. So even if you're a household or applicant, and, and you know, the logical thing, of course, is to go and speak to your neighbours or um, you know, talk to people about what you're proposing, because that, that normally means that it has a much easier um, consideration for the application, because people understand what's being proposed. Um, so you know, we, that's why we refer to applicants and not explicit around different scales of development or, pl or, pl or, pl or planning agents or, 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 or housing developers as such, because we want to keep it as, um, uh, you know, all scales of development will, should, should have appropriate proportionate engagement. If I may, Chair, just to pursue on those. Okay, well, thanks for your replies. I, I would like to suggest that it would be helpful if it could state in this document that there will be some encouragement given for the small applicants that uh, applicants do notify their neighbours. Um, not, not, not require, but just to just encourage it. it um, I don't think you answered on the, the bit about the not in accordance with development plan, why neighbours wouldn't be notified by uh, about those. Um, can I also suggest that from this committee um, that we ask um, for the current policy to remain? So this relates to Appendix 1. It's 3.25 is our bit. 
Um, and there it says um, the council is required to publicise an application either by serving written notice to neighbours or by displaying a site notice. Um, I, I would like our committee to say that we would like both of those to continue to happen as they do at the moment. Um, otherwise, this is a sa saving by stealth um, without us being um, notified where the practice that we have at the moment could change because this is not what happens, at least in my area at the, the, the moment, and, and I think we need to, to keep it the, the same, and I'd be uh, concerned if it changes to what is suggested in this, uh, in this document. Um, so, uh, Pat, uh, if, if there is anything, if, if it's not, I mean, if you are able to respond on why um, applicants which do not accord with the development plan aren't notified to neighbours, if you can say why they, neighbours shouldn't be notified, I, I can't, as I say, I think they, they should be and may want to know about them even more. So, are you able to answer that one? I think it's the nuance of how the different types of applications are set out because the in the table, if any one of those points bites, then it's, it, it triggers the requirement. So I think, I think it's there, um, particularly to pick up on the need to advertise, even if it's non-mage development, which doesn't accord with the development plan. But the point is, is if it fell within any of those other considerations, I, it being non-mage development anyway, um, which is, I think, the second row from the bottom of that page, then it, it triggers the notifi neighbour notification anyway. So I think it's, pick it's picking up on the fact that non-mage developments um, would otherwise not need a newspaper advertisement if they were to not accord with the development plan. So to pick up on the point that any application which doesn't accord with the development plan would require an appropriate newspaper advertisement, if that makes sense. It should, it, it should, you have to sort of... Yeah. I, th I, think, I think in terms of a simple answer, it would be picked up on the fact that it would be covered by the other application types which are caught. Um, and the reason for having that point about not according uh, with the development plan is to, is to explicitly mean that newspaper advertisements are required for non-mage developments which don't accord with the development plan. So, for example, if you had nine dwellings at, in, the, in the countryside, um, that wouldn't technically put, the, put a trigger being non-major for an advertisement in the newspaper that would trigger that it would be required. You go back, come back. Well, well, I'm not clear. I was only asking about neighbour notifications. I'll just keep my fingers crossed and hope it works out okay. I must admit I'm in complete fog and don't understand why they shouldn't be notified, but let, let's leave it there. It's not that important. We dealt with issues where neighbours didn't know um, of planning applications uh, because they were perhaps back to back rather than next door. I would support what the councillor is saying. I think it's, it's, um, it's quite clear. It needs to be clear in, in my view as well. But we're not a committee that can vote on something in, the, in those terms. So I think uh, we have to ask you to take that on board. Martin? I think I... If, if I may, the yeah. other thing though we, that we can do and is part of our function is to make recommendations... Part of our function is to make recommendations to executive when they take the decision. So I've made a couple of suggestions for recommendations I hope that we can make uh, in, in regard to the neighbourhood notifications and having a chat with neighbours. So if, if I could ask that those be put forward as part of what the report from scrutiny which goes to, uh, goes to executive. I, I think I, I would support that. If, if there's anybody around the table who violently opposes that suggestion, then, then do speak now. Oh, Marcus. Can you just clarify what that suggestion is again? Is that what you were going to ask? I think Paul Hickson is, is Paul Hickson's online, and he will come in and uh, perhaps help to answer that question. I was going to suggest that maybe in addition to any any kind of feedback made that we also provide um, Councillor Mansour with a, with a detailed written response on the matters he's raising. We, we, we're getting into, I would uh, su suggest, maybe quite operational matters about the treatment of individual uh, notifications related to planning applications. So we might want to give him a, a written overview of the position to supplement the, the, the kind of the, the discussion had at the committee itself. I think we'd welcome that. Um... I'm not sure where to go with this now. <laughs> Sorry, Adam. Thank, thank you, Chair. I'm thinking I'm, I'm supporting 
I'd like to support Councillor Mansell's request for uh, some sort of recommendation in, in relation to the document sets out the statutory requirements for, in, for either notifying neighbours by letter or putting a site notice up and sets the circumstances out for that. But in some cases, uh, in parts of the, of the county, and, and often both methods of publicity are appropriate, and maybe they are done well sometimes, and maybe sometimes they, they, we, in our divisions we have had problems with when neighbours haven't been notified by letter and haven't seen the site notice, and there's much more fuss made at that point than if they'd seen it. Um, and so there's trouble with that when that doesn't happen. So maybe a, a briefing note would be useful on, on, on that, but also it may be appropriate to recommend that a no something is added into this SCI document at that point, 324, that says in many cases both a site notice and na neighbour notification letters may be appropriate or will be appropriate. But we can recommend that, can't we? Uh, Dave's not in agreement with that, so... Um I, did, did, we, did, did we all get that from Adam? It's a sort of summary of... Chair, is that, is that, def <coughs> Sorry, is that definitely the recommendation then? So what... Yes. I'm, take, I'm taking okay. what... Day, I'm sorry, I'm taking what Adam said as a recommendation. Right, okay. And so that is seconded. Yeah. Do, do you, Marcus, do you, do you still want a... a well, so, for, so for clarity, what we're saying is, apart from site notices that I think sometimes get sent in the post for the applicant to put up, um, are we saying that, apart from site notices, that letters go to neighbours? And have we made a definition of neighbours? Because nobody in South Wales notified me when they put a wind turbine up. And I can see that from my window. Okay. All right, Dave, have a go. This did come up because this was a budget saving, some may recall, and, it were, and officers at that time did say it would be adjacent neighbours, so what those living next door. So there was some indication then. So if I can, I think, yeah, <coughs> there's a recommendation there that will go forward. As Paul says, we'll, we'll clarify in writing, I'm not close enough to the detail to get definitions of neighbours. I think, so we're not making up a change on the hoof that is definitely going into this document. You're making a recommendation that we will consider. We'll write back and we'll update you and you'll be able to see that before it goes through to exec, yeah? I think, I think we have to settle for that. Yeah, okay, uh, that's, that's the only power we have, the power of recommendation. Um, and uh, we seem to be uh, mostly in agreement over that. So thank you very much for that. Now, uh, somebody else had their hand up. Was it Alan? Yeah. Um, what a big subject this is. It's, 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 it's more important than drainage planning. I've been involved in Sedgemoor and it was 16 years and, you, and the record of Sedgemoor District Council stands for itself. The development they've had and the things they haven't stood still, they've got on with it and everybody else is trying to play catch up. That's the reality of it all, I'm sorry. But if, if we've got a system at the moment when planning officers leave, are leaving, staff is very short within the offices and the system is going to break down. In fact, it's starting to break down already. Anybody spending their own money, if the time they start applying for a planning consent, the time they get it might take two and a half, maybe three years, right? In that period of time, the, the house, the, what it costs and the budgets that people got to go within builders and everything else to do it is totally thrown out the door. That you'll find as a county council ruling out a lot of the contract you've made to be thrown out the door because it just doesn't work. And it takes too long. There's too many surveys. I'm going to be really, really bold now and, and honest. I always am honest. I had to be because that's, you, you, you can always answer your question in truth then. Local t parish and town councils, People get on that committee very often to try and stop a bit of planning. They're a bit damn nuisance. And by God, they are sometimes. They're very well informed, and they do hold the procedure up. There's no point beating about the bush. That's how it is. Now, regardless of politics, I, would, I, I don't bring that into it, but I'm going to. We don't know the policies of various other parties regarding development because we've got some parties all full of the immigrants coming in, everybody supplying houses and all the rest of them for them. You get, they don't want to build no houses. So, so that, so that to me, just don't sound right. It just don't sound right. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a chap. I've been involved in development a couple of times in my time. Is I got a lot of experience in dealing with these things. Sill payments. 
That's the thing that often dictates people's minds when it comes to a planning consent at a parish or town council meeting, it's still payments. Are they going to continue at the same rate as they have? Because most developers in our area in Sergemore, they've cut, as you know, from 30% down to 10% to get granted planning consent, and then they cut the, the, the affordable homes number, and that affects everything else. Is the SEAL payments going to stay the same, and are we going to be subject to all these rules? I'm trying to, I'm trying to be quite honest here, because you've got to go survey for this, and a survey for that, and a survey for this, and a survey for that, and a survey for this. With a survey and, and tied up the apps that's coming into our life, I'm beginning to think, hmm, maybe it's time I went backwards. SEAL payments. I mean, is there an answer on that one? I mean, at the moment, we have separate charging areas for SIL payments for the different former district authorities who adopted SIL. So that doesn't change at the moment. Um, I think, it, you know, it, it will have to be considered going forward, but of course, there's an awful lot of planning reform around, around abandoning SIL. So we'll have to react, I think we have to probably be more reactive to what the national reforms, which, which, which might come through over changes from the community infrastructure levy to a different, different form. But I think, if, I mean, as what Alan suggested, like, but it illustrates the challenges over preparing a local plan in terms of all the things you've listed over the, the things which impact on development and the viability of development. Um, you know, with local plan reviews, you have to consider things like um, affordable housing contributions, new, new policy things such as biodiversity net gain, phosphates, if there's still a need for phosphate mitigation. Um, and all these, you know, things like development viability is going to be one of the very involved areas which the new local plan is going to have to look at in terms of making sure it's a deliverable plan. Um, so that, I hope that answers the question. So there's no immediate plans in the local development scheme. I'm looking nervously at Laura to, to review SIL at the moment, but that is because of a national reform. So I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Laura. Uh, well, so, we do. No, um, it, it, uh, Ros Wyke is, is um, has a hand up. I think you'd like to... Okay. Um, just to um, say that the officer is correct, um, SIL payments currently are based on the local plans in each of the areas, and it will take the new local plan for the whole of the county before the SIL payment can be changed or altered or introduced. By 2028. Yeah. Um, the second thing is that um, yes, you're right, there are lots of plans um, and reports need to be done now on planning because, you know, life is changing and we are very dependent on the national framework. So, yes, um, developers do need to produce a flood plan so they don't build on the floodplain. They do need to produce plans from this month, next month on BioNet um, gain. Um, and they do need to produce plans on the impact it has on the wider environment, etc. So, um, while I appreciate you may be yearning for the day when somebody could knock up a few houses without too much trouble, the reality is now that the national planning process is very complex, it's subject to continual change, and the officers need to take that into account when uh, considering planning applications. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that response. Thank you. Yeah. And we've worked together in Stradeborough for a number of years, and you know what sort of a character I am. I'm going to quit that save survey out for one, if I can, Mr. Chairman. It, it's a hell of a cost for development, these BAT surveys, and it takes an awful long time. Now, most people, in particular farmers, they would agree to do it without all the, without all the red tape and the trouble. You, you, you just don't want it. You've got somebody in your attic two or three times a year, and, and you find a different sort of a bat, and it's another survey. And I think it needs, needs to be looked at if you want houses built quicker. And if you, if you don't have houses built quicker, you're going to have a lot more people homeless, and the rents are going to continue to rise. I'm sure you wouldn't want to see that. I think it's what we can do. I agree with you, Alan, but I think it's what we can do within the limits of the local plan as, as verified by, from, from central government. We, we are responsible to them, and they, they dictate many of the, the um, considerations that we have to operate under. I right, uh, think Dave wanted to come back. Then I'd like to ask Helen Kay to come in online, please. 
Right, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I've got comments on the, the local plan, and to be honest, these are actually the more significant ones for, 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 for me. Um, so, a few points. Uh, just, like uh, if I may, then, because the, we're moving on uh, yeah. somewhat. So, let me let me just. I, I, I'm just anticipating Helen might want to talk about um, that, the, the issue of planning specifically. Helen, are you there? Would you like to answer your question first? Um, well, no. Hello, thank you, um, Chair. Um, my questions were not on the SCI, they were about the local plan. So I don't know if Dave uh, Mansell, as a committee member, wants to speak first. Um, so or shall I go ahead? No, you go ahead. OK, um, right. Thank you. Um, so um, looking at page 64, I'm actually going to get up the report. So I can't see what I... Uh, looking at page 64 of the report, um, it says that um, we have to do this local development scheme. We have to do it within five years and we basically don't have any leeway and there's no other way of doing it. Um, I understand that there's the development documents have to be done. And then it says other options considered. There is no alternative option to meet the statutory requirement. All I want to do is a point of information, really, is that. When we had, um, I was on the Constitution and Government Committee and we had we did have an opportunity to either have the local plan overseen by a subcommittee of the executive, um, which we have more detail about that in Appendix 2, or it could have been a small committee um, of the full council. So um, there, there didn't really seem to be very much debate on it. And it went through as being a subcommittee of the executive, which will um, have on it, according to Appendix 2, uh, Councillor Ros White and Councillor Mike Rigby and a couple of others. Um, so just to, uh, to bring that to people's um, awareness is that that means that it's all going to be decided, uh, sort of the, the managed by the administration. If that is going to be the case, can I please ask Dixie Darch to consider putting herself forward to also be on that subcommittee so that we do have um, a balance, of, um, so we so we have somebody that knows about environmental issues that sit and the, the climate change issues on sitting on that subcommittee, um, and um, that that would then, given the, the the rationale reading through the the fact that they're saying at the moment that we. We can't have um, another development plan document addressing climate change. I think it's really important to have somebody managing the process that understands all the, those issues around climate change. So that's my first suggestion. Um, the second thing is re just regarding um, MENDIP in particular. Um, we've got this problem with we've got to find an extra 505 houses. And on page 68, um, it's paragraph 19. I don't really quite understand. There's something in this paragraph. I don't understand what it means. Um, it's near the bottom and it, uh, paragraph 19. It says um, that uh, we have to we have to, a certain timetable that's been given to us by the inspector. We've got to get all this done up within about a year um, to find an extra 505 houses. And the allocations process has just changed. Um, the bidding process has been taking place over the summer and it's just finished. Um, then it says at the bottom here, given the need to bring forward a Somerset wide development plan, a wider exercise for the east area, e.g. more housing or review of strategic policies is neither warranted or justified. I don't really understand what that sentence means. So I wanted to ask a question about that sentence. And then I'd like to maybe if you could um, answer those questions first and then I'd like to come back and have a third question. Or shall I go on and say the third question now? No, stop there a minute, because I think yeah. for, I'm going to ask Ros White to, to come in. You you had an answer to one of those questions, I think. Most definitely. Um, the papers were um, published before the decision was made. And yes, um, the portfolio holder for climate is a member of the subcommittee as a specified individual. And I'll hand over to the officer to respond. That's great. To Thank you very much. On the, on the other matter. Thank you. Yes, on that paragraph 19, I think you might have pointed out a minor typo. It's meant to be saying that given the need to bring forward a Somerset wide development plan, a wider exercise beyond the east area is not warranted or justified at this time. Because the focus of the call for sites that went was were closed a few weeks ago, month last month, and um, that was specifically focused on the east area to, to deal with the Mendip local plan review. And that paragraph is saying that at this moment in time, 
the call for sites is, is not going beyond the east area because that will happen through the Somerset wide development plan. So, sorry, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. that call for sites and the way that we decide how we allocate those sites is we are we are going to have a briefing on this next week I think but I assume it's going to be uh, done within the current um, local plan framework that we have for Mendip and which will basically push most of the housing towards Froome I imagine um, but that's so it doesn't it's not we're not going to be having any kind of strategic review I read it as a possible strategic review of policies for the Mendip local plan. That's not going to happen. Yes, that's correct. No. Yes. OK, thank you. Right. OK, so I'll move on to my third, my third question, which is that um, obviously there's quite a long justification in here for why we shouldn't have um, a separate um, development plan document running in parallel to um, uh, developing a local plan. And it's explaining that it, it's a bit about resources, basically, um, that we haven't got the staff. If we take it, it, it's it's it, it puts forward two possible um, um, plans of action. One is a, a, a development plan document, and it says that it's too onerous to do that. Um, and anyway, we're going to be looking at all the climate change issues as part of the local plan. The problem is, is that that doesn't become um, sort of law. We can't use it till 2028. Um, possibly 2029 even. And in the meantime, we've got six years where where there's developers are coming forward and, and there are, I think, three out of five old development plans are not um, current and we, we have housing shortages. And so we're getting inappropriate um, developments large for large housing states coming forward and, and we have very little to be able to back them off with and and if, if at least we can get high levels of um, you know uh, sort of saving as many trees and, and hedgerows as possible and getting high levels of energy efficiency and solar panels on everything etc that would be helpful and if we could do that within a year um, if it takes a year to, to to do that or two years, I actually think that is pretty important. I mean, we just had discussions earlier about about flooding and how highways are having to deal with flooding. And wouldn't it be great if if we made sure that every single new estate had, you know, the, the, the onus was on the developer um, to, to put in sufficient drainage capacity, not on us as a local authority to have to pick it up after, pick the problem up after they've created the problem. Um, you know, it, it, it seems to me to, to be very logical to be trying to do this first um, and that we, we really need to find those resources somehow to bring to bring people in to, to do that development plan document. Um, I, I, if if that is impossible, there is a second, absolutely impossible, and I, I'm really not convinced it is. There is a second option, which is about some guidance. Guidance is obviously not as weighty, um, but there's a second best idea, which is taken from I think it was Somerset West and Taunton that there's some guidance that already exists. It's called climate positive planning, and there was a suggestion that that could be rolled out. But even that has to be apparently consulted on, and it's been suggested it's going to take one officer one year to um, to do that and even that is considered too onerous i would say that if that's if that's the the second option and it's not as and it's not as any as um resource intensive that we really should be considering that um even if it's just guidance um and um trying to bring people in and and i know there isn't a magic money tree and i know we've got all kinds of issues with with with, with staff but i i'm i suppose i'm expressing my disappointment about about what's written in this report and the fact that we are saying we're not going to to, to do this. I mean, even, even earlier on, I only joined the meeting late when you were talking about the um, the forward plan. I see that I saw I very quickly looked at it and we're on amber for getting the climate emergency plan together. And as I understand it, we've got staff shortages and, and we haven't really got started on putting a climate emergency plan together. I'm just wondering how we're we actually tackling this if, if this this if we're not tackling it through plan if we're not tackling it through the climate emergency plan. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm expressing Thank my frustration. You, Over to you. Thank Over you. to you. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to let Dave Mansell back in on, at this point. 
Thank you. Thank you. And probably the main thing I did wish to raise was on the, the DVD. I've got some other points as well. I would have done all three together, but perhaps if I, given uh, if I just talk about the DVD... You know, if you can uh, relate to I, that, that's good. Yeah, so I'll just talk about that for the moment, if I may. Um, OK, and, I, and it's something I've been raising for quite some time, um, and I do note what's said in the, uh, the report. I do think it would be helpful if I could just give a little bit more information on what I've got in mind, at least, for, for, for this. Um, I think perhaps, actually, as Helen mentioned it, I, I, I should actually start just by talking about the, um, the climate positive planning as, a, as an approach, which is good, and I'm pleased it happened in Somerset, West and Taunton, but it did take a bit of resource to put together. And I have to say it's really quite complicated, though. Um, and um, So it's, it's a value, and I'm really pleased it's there. Um, what difference it makes, I'm not so quite so sure. Um, hopefully it does make some difference, but it, it's just aspirational and it tries to encourage um, applicants to, to adopt it. But partly because it's so complicated, I think most of them don't understand it. Um, and perhaps it might just have been simple to say, we would like you to do this, we can't require you to do this, we would like to do this, and maybe that would have been another way that it could be more simply applied across the, the, whole, uh, the whole of Somerset. So I, I, I sort of put that as a positive idea, but, but not to say, you know, if the climate positive planning, which, uh, which is what was done in Somerset, Western Taunton, is the only thing that can be done, it is good, but I do appreciate resource that, that takes, and as you guys, a few reservations. What, to me, is much more important, and it's partly as a result of seeing what happened with the climate positive planning and the fact that it didn't make a lot of difference, why having a DPD is important, in my view, um, and would like to, to see it happening. Now, and I, too, as Helen indicated, would like to see the resources provided for this. Don't want to take anything away from what the local plan and stopping the local plan proceeding with your five years. Don't wish to stop that. This is something else that needs doing that would be part of it in any case, but needs being done more quickly. Um, now, there is a question of what does it cover now, for me, the most important things to cover where it could make a difference, and I'm sure there are others, uh, but the ones I particularly put forward are zero carbon energy standards for new development, and it requires it to be part of planning policy. That's the way to, to, take, it, to, to take it forward. Um, the, uh, uh, and it does make a difference. It means those houses will actually have the insulation levels which we well need. And it won't have to be added in again later on and cost more. It can be done once the, the standard then, uh, then applies. The other thing that it can do is um, have planning policies which cover renewable energy generation and storage in the right locations within Somerset. And that can be enabled a lot better if we've got some policies behind it. And we had a report earlier on where most, a lot of the preparation work has been done. That's what this um, local area energy plan and the energy resource assessments has done. So we've actually got a lot of the background work done and then we're not going to be able to take it forward because we're going to have to, have to wait. And the logical place, one of the, uh, that can do a number of things, but one of the places where it needs to take forward is through planning policy. And the DPT could, could do that. So those are two of the main areas, possibly the only areas given resources. Um, there may be others that, that potentially might be easily added, but I, I'd pick those two out in particular. One that I would also consider, though, is adaptation, where we are seeing the, we're, we're, climate change is happening. We're seeing it's occurring more and causing problems. And the sooner we can get some planning policies built into the system so um, uh, houses and development is designed better to, to cope with that, the sooner and the longer we leave it, the more difficult these problems are. So that would be another potential candidate, but you know, I, I would take others' advice who will know more on, on that one about what could be achieved. Now, I'm sure they will all be in the in the, the final plan, but the trouble is it's not till 2028. We're waiting too long. And the work needs doing, so it will be, it will be there. 
we can learn from some other areas which have developed the evidence in these areas and have done it. And I particularly draw attention to Bath and North East Somerset, who've done it as part of their local plan, Cornwall and Warwick, who've done it as DPDs. So we've got, so, and, and Cornwall and Warwick in particular shared what some of what they have done, and I'm sure would be happy to share with us too. So we've got a little bit of a head start for part of it. Um, from what I can gather, in Cornwall and Warwick, it is hard to work out quite when they started from reading their committee papers, but it looks like it took no more than three years, but it does take a time. But even that, I think, is worth doing to get those in place and done. And that's the main message I, I'm putting, simply because we've got to get on with this. We've got to show some urgency. These things are important, and we need to, we need to move them on. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Um, Adam. Mm, um, thank you. I just think I'm just thinking, like, uh, I believe Helen Kay has sent something online, but I'd like to make a proposal that clearly that this is a, a, a big issue for many of us on the committee, some of us at least, that the climate change policies uh, are, should be a priority in light of the Council's climate emergency declarations, a climate strategy, which we're doing, and the energy plan we talked about earlier, that we have a look again, that we, we as a committee make a recommendation that the need for a climate change specific DPD in whatever form, uh, however light touch we can do, do, looking at our previous other examples, is looked at again as a priority in the plan process and that potential external funding and opportunities for resourcing that is, is looked at again because it's a priority of, of this council. I'd like to make that recommendation. Uh, if, we, if we can adopt that, great. I'm prepared to take that as a proposal that can be second, seconded. Um, if, yeah. if I may, I mean, I, I'm happy. I believe that's what I just proposed. Uh, I mean, whether if I didn't use the right words, but I'm very happy, happy if Adam would like to, to second it and please that you're happy with it as well. But I think that was the whole thrust of what I was just saying. Yeah, you see. <laughs> it, it, it. Uh, so uh, I took it the other way, but that's okay. I'm happy to change that round, but Ros wants to come in. I'd like to remind um, Councillor Boyd and others who have sat through the years of developing a local plan, but as the local plan starts maturing, it then becomes evidence which you can then bring forward on planning applications, because this, the emer the, I think the correct term is the emerging plan becomes increasingly materially um, relevant to regarding planning applications. And I'd just like to remind people that um, plans are basically like uh, so scarce, it's very difficult, particularly planning policy people. And if we're going to try and do the local plan in five years, then the more, more additional chores and jobs and things we ask them to do over and above what is going to be quite significant when the phosphate floodgates open as well, which we anticipate may actually happen, that um, to look for an additional um, document which is going to be fed in all the way through the local plan, I think is probably um, a little optimistic best will in the world, it's going to take three years. Three years will have a, an emerging local plan which will have the elements of it. Great work is being done on the energy and um, plan and various other things. So it's not as if it's been done in a totally empty environment. A huge amount of work is being done on collecting information and making sure that we have the evidence for the examination of our new plan. So. I think asking for an additional three year uh, looking at a DPD is, I think, a, a, a little optimistic. Doesn't mean we shouldn't go away and look at it again. I'm quite happy to do that. But I'm just trying to be, as, as Alan was saying, as, as truthful as possible that we have, we're really up against it to actually get the local plan in place for um, 2028. I think I accept all of that and accept the logistics, but as far as the scrutiny committee, we're here to, to scrutinise, we're here to make suggestions and come up with recommendations that we'll then go back. And I think a very sound recommendation has been made that should, be, should go back and be considered. 
Um, so I'm prepared to put that. But before I do that, Mike Stanton is on the line, has been waiting a long time. I'd like to hear what he's got to say first in case it impacts on this debate. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for indulging me as a non-member of the committee. Can you hear me? Fine. Can you hear me? It sounds as if you can't hear me. We can hear you. Oh, yes, thank you. Yes, we can hear you, Mike, yes. Thanks, Henry. Um, yes, two things. Firstly, on um, Helen's question about sustainable urban drainage schemes, um, I was under the impression that we were now requiring these, but a point worth making is that the Rivers Authority, which I chair, has done a lot of work on how to make those work and, and how well, what, which ones work well. So that will be worth looking at for this committee. The, the other point related to the debate you've just been having, uh, it really um, stems from uh, Councillor Allen and Black Bradford's remarks. Um, and that is the building building lots of houses. Yes, Sedgemore has approved lots of development, but it's a lot of it is built on the floodplain, uh, and that really potentially depends a bit on whether the Bridgewater barrier gets built and works and lasts long enough. But um, it potentially creates a lot of problems. As chair of the SRA, I've spent a lot of time, particularly since the January's near flood event. Um, uh, listening to people um, who are at risk simply because their houses were built where they really shouldn't have been built. Um, and this it would be useful if this committee could look at that aspect of, of planning and stop us building houses on the floodplain. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Um, okay. Um, we're, we're going to move it. I think we, we need to move this to a conclusion. Um, uh, okay, Marcus. Sorry, I was going to say a couple of things, but then I've lost the will to live somewhere along, somewhere since one o'clock, I think. Um, a couple of questions, actually, get back to you know, the report and the documents in front of us. Um, I've been looking. When's this um, about? I can't find a date, but how long is this local plan going to run to? Just that's the first question. That's to be decided, but it would be probably 20 years. So I'm 54. If I don't blow a valve, which don't though local plans do get, don't we don't wait 20 years before it gets reviewed. You, you have to review it every five reviewed, years. Yeah. They can get reviewed, but let's be realistic. What actually, what, what actually happens is, is like everybody looks at the dip, looks at how much it's going to, uh, how much it's going to um, take to review it, and then think, well, we can't be bothered really. It's okay. We'll muddle along. So that means if I don't Blow valve, I'll be 74. Um, I'll be long gone if I'm not dead, so that's fine. Um, I think what my question, I suppose, looking at this document, and I did print it out, and I apologise to Dixie and anyone and the, the Green Party for printing it out, but it's going to be very entertaining reading on the toilet. Um, and th that was mainly the comments. And um, my favourite is comment 131, fantastic. I think me and Alan should just start our own party, actually, to be honest. Um, but I think, I mean, it says something, I think, on this is when the police's comments are probably the most sane, um, it's just it's just, in, just very interesting. And I think the questions I'd like to ask is, of the consultation responses, how many of the individual responses are also members of parish councillors, also members of parish councils, um, and how many that excludes then businesses that are actually in the planning industry? So that would be nice to know if that data is available. Um, on that, and I'd love to know if anybody under the age of 40 actually consulted on it. I mean, it's just incredible reading the comments. I mean, there you go, I was just at a loss. Um, newspaper adverts, who runs a newspaper? Who reads a newspaper? Anybody here bought a newspaper? No, anybody bought a newspaper? You know one of those things that come on paper? No. Anybody else Not in the room? Years, no. no. I think the last newspaper I bought was a Sunday Sport, for God's sake. I mean, and the other thing is, we've got in here, and I, I'm all for equality and diversity, I'm sorry if I'm getting agitated, but I'm very hungry now, and the Tic Tacs didn't hit the spot. Um, I'm all for equality and diversity, but it says people unwilling to use digital means. Not people not capable, you know, not people who can't use an iPhone or don't know how the internet works. Or can't, people unwilling to use digital means. It's like in the 70s. Remember those people like your great aunt didn't have a telephone because the, you know, the world might end if you dare have a telephone and something. I mean, it's bonkers. Why are we putting up with these people? You know, if they can't be bothered to use the internet, why are we putting down with them? No, I'm on one. I'm not. I'm, I'm just, it's just ridiculous.
Christmas. And I don't, so, um, and what I would say is, I don't envy planning officers. I don't envy planning officers. Michael Gove with his permitted development rights. Well, I wonder why he's making those changes or wants to make those changes. And I think we do have to have a long look at whether, you know, the plan-led system as a system has failed. You know, has it failed? We've got no houses. We've got all those houses not being built because of phosphates. We've got people homeless. We've got families staying with homelessness. You know, at some point, we've got to have a look at this local plan and think, well, we look at the consultations for a start and we've got to have a look at it and think, how quick can we do it? With regard to your climate change um, proposal, I'm tended to agree with it because I do think it's important enough and I do think how we get that in there so it's important and I don't think I think the executive will use resources and no criticism of the executive here um, but you only have to look at what happened with the history of a solar farm in in West Somerset and it was hysteria it was unbelievable I mean and then you have people going on about at one end you have people going on about food security and the same you look at all the biofuels being grown we stopped buying stop growing biofuels that would solve half the food security problem so I do think there's that policy in the with climate change development plan is possibly something that this committee that I support and have that put forward. I'm going to maybe shut up before I put my foot in. <laughs> I, I think that's um, probably I, wise, but you're... I do you're, have you're, one you're, final thing. I, right, do okay. think, I do think encouraging people to speak to their neighbours is um, very admirable, David, if not a little bit naive. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, a sort of outburst there of, 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 of I've been probably told. quite appropriate uh, annoyance and agitation but um, if I no, can no, just come back chair no, no, I've been told to keep quiet as well I asked me keeping quiet no I think you uh, I think you you I, I understand I sympathize with your your frustrations I think um, however you did support sorry Helen make it quick please I'm about to die Quite sure where we went with Adam and um, and Dave's proposal. Let me run the meeting, please. Thank you. The the the, the um, I, I believe Adam repeated what David said, although David not made it as a pro proposal. So I'm going to take it back to Dave to make the proposal, Adam to second it, and then we'll take a vote on recommendation. Thank you very much. Recommendation with the process involved. You make a recommendation. Does that then go back to the local plan subcommittee and then they respond to it and do we get a response in writing to this environment committee so, Mickey, please. well yeah ros wants to come in as well but the decision we're consulting you on includes setting establishing that subcommittee so it doesn't yet exist um, so i think this will be reflected in what we take through the exec we've heard a strong view from the from this scrutiny committee of the desire for doing more more quickly on climate change in particular a dpd and i think that will go forward get reflected in the paper to exec but i'll pass over to Roz as well yes okay um dave can you in a nutshell put this proposal I think that probably was it, what, what Mickey just said. So it, it, it is that um, uh, we asked the exec to, to look at doing a DPD, which especially advances our, uh, some of our climate emergency uh, objectives, in particular zero carbon energy standards, new development, renewable energy generation uh, siting, maybe some more. Um, but uh, uh, I, th I think that is it in a, in a nutshell. Uh, Adam, do you want to? Ed, yeah. that's, that's fine, Adam. Can I say yes, that, that's right, and, and a, to be separate from the local plan and to an earlier time scale yeah. to reflect the climate emergency stra uh, declaration. Okay. I'm putting that to the vote. I'll retain. The, Tom, would you like to speak? I, I will put that to those in and I will retain my right to a casting vote on it. Um, so those in favour of the proposal, please. That's carried. Thank you very much. Right. Um, we are at an end of this meeting, which, which went on incredibly long. I'm sorry. Yes, so I'm really sorry. I, I, I would have got them all in earlier. It's been a little bit of a problem having the community engagement and the local plan in one report. I think this is muddled. It should have been two reports. But anyway, 
let, I, I think it is important, other things. I, I, I will restrict it to one. I would have had two. But um, the, the, also, uh, the bit on the local plan is about setting up a subcommittee of the executive. And we talked to, uh, about that. I would just like to check and make sure I understand. It will follow executive procedure rules. So, I, one, I can we check that means other members can speak at that. It would be a public meeting. The other aspect is, what scrutiny will there be? So, uh, um, ideally, I would have liked to have seen a more cross-party process for this, which is the route Somerset Western Taunton previously took when it started on its local plan. Uh, I think that's not going to happen. But can we at least be told what's going to happen for scrutiny on the local plan, for the wider involvement of other members, and especially the other, the other groups, because at the moment there's nothing there. Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Mansell, I just wanted to reassure you that we're, we're planning to set up a local plans cross-party working group of some such name um, to hopefully provide that scrutiny, and which will deal with a lot of the early stages of development of policies, um, scrutinise the options that we're going to be looking at. So that will hopefully form that, that element for you. Well, that's good. It'd be added to the report when it goes to executive, because that, that's very important. Yeah, can I come in? Sorry. Yeah, so I think we'll reflect on that and now just section in on about how we do all that wider, because engagement and scrutiny are two slightly different roles. So I think we'll take away the, the question and reflect it in the final report. Yeah? Are you all right? Uh, you've done. Right, thank you. I'm not, not diminishing what you've said. I, uh, and therefore, that's the last item, I hope. You what? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you could say no, I got it wrong. There's a, that's the last item on the agenda. I'd just like to say before we go, yes, Henry, I want we want to discuss the chairman, next week. We agreed before this meeting we, finished, we did. we'd sort out the October date. And I am just about to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and any other business. But what I suggest is we won't be able to set a date amongst ourselves until we know when the experts are going to be available. So I suggest that we um, ask is it would it be Kirsty's? Okay. We, you and I, I would like you to be involved in this with me and Adam in setting this up and, and we get back to Kirsty we ask her to, to contact the appropriate people, I think probably copy one another into an email and we then set a date. And we can't open diaries now and decide who's not because inevitably some of us won't be available. Is that okay? Yes, Mr Chairman, the only thing I would say is that we need to get on with inviting people because we're now running out of time from July when this decision was absolutely. originally made. I absolutely agree with you. Of course, the cancellations have not been our fault. Yeah, OK, right, thank you very much. There was only one calculation, and that was Peter Lamb. The, um, yeah, there's a, there's a meeting Natural England that, refused that, to come if he wasn't... I, I don't want to prolong the meeting, but Wessex Water pulled out of a previous invitation. Didn't they? No, they didn't, Mr. Chairman. Matt Wheel and, and has been okay. in contact with then me. I, then I apologise if I got that wrong. It must have been a conversation I misheard. Um, the meeting is now over. Thank you very much.